My name is John Markoff, and I'm a historian at the Computer History Museum. Um, and this interview is part of the ACM Turing Award Oral History Project. Today is Monday, uh, February 26, 2018, and we are at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. I'm conducting this interview with Raj Reddy, who won the Turing Award in 1994 for the design and construction of large-scale artificial intelligence systems demonstrating the practical importance of potential commercial impact of artificial intelligence technology. He was the founding director of the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. He was also instrumental in helping to create Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies in India. Um, so good morning. Can we start by having you uh, tell us your complete name? My complete name is Dabala Rajagopal Reddy. Uh, so That's when I was in Australia, nobody could say the whole name or even the middle person of the name. So I shortened it to Raj Reddy. Perfect. I've gone by that name for now almost 60, 70 years. So <laughs> Perfect. That, that's, that's fine. So um, I'm going to begin by asking you about your family life. And could you give us um, some family background? I'd be interested in your parents, where they came from, what they did, and maybe your earliest memories and whether you had any siblings. Yes. So I come from a small village called Khartour, which is about 60 miles from Madras, which is now called Chennai. And um, that village is still there. Our house I grew up in is still there. And uh, we were mainly, I wouldn't call it landed gentry, uh, like in, but you know, we were probably the we were richest family in the village and in the neighborhood. But compared to other riches, we were very poor. You know, it, my father could not afford to send me to college without some some strain. You know. Okay. Okay. And um, I had, I have, uh, I had three brothers and three sisters. We were a family of seven. And uh, my bro all my brothers have passed away, but my, all my sisters are still alive. And where were you in the family? Right in the middle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the youngest son? Uh, no, I was the third son. Third son. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, very early memories from the, from the family home. Do you have any childhood memories that are? Yeah, you know, basically, you know, it's, I, I imagine when you read Jane Austen or something, the manor. So there are all these animals and, you know, chicken and pigs and cattle and the whole place, you know, and then vegetables growing. And you can kind of, the, it was very self sufficient community. Everything you needed was there. You never had to leave, leave the village. And was your father a farmer? Yeah. What did he farm? Um, mainly rice, but also various, you know, at that time there was a big demand for indigo blue, you know. So you, they would kind of grow the, uh, the plant and then extract the, the dye out of it. And that was, you know. And, and did he have people who worked for him? Did he hire yeah, laborers yeah. to work on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things I remember well, you know. I never worked in the farm, right? But I would stand around, you know, and kind of even though I was only 10 years old or five years old, uh, I'm supposed to be supervising all these workers. <laughs> it, it's not uh, Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And um, you, I think I saw someplace that you mentioned a significant drought and famine during the Second World War. Do you have yeah, memories of right, living through yeah. that? So basically, you know, I was never hungry or never without food. But a lot of the people in, um, in my, our village did not have enough to eat, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and even in my case, you know, compared to what we used to have and what we had afterwards, for that seven-year period, it was pretty lean pickings, you know, so uh, maybe we never had a non-vegetarian or even an egg once a day, maybe, because there was no water to grow the chicken. That's very striking. Um, so, uh, uh, once again about the village, were there hundreds or thousands in the village? I'm trying to get a it's, sense. It's of hundreds, hundreds, maybe 500 yes. people. Yeah. It, I, maybe at this point, after 60 years, 70 years after I have left, 
it's probably still only a thousand people. And when you're growing up, was the village electrified? No. Wow. There was no electricity, no running water, and most of us walked around barefoot, and I didn't have uh, sandals or shoes till I was 16 or something. Not that we couldn't afford it, it's just that not the expected okay. thing. And do you remember anything about communications? Was communications about newspapers? Was there any telegraph line that came to the village or? No, no newspapers also. Wow. Only when I went to the school in the nearby town, Kalasthi, the, I would kind of be you know, interested in finding out what's in the newspaper. This, the, at that time I must be in the eighth grade or something, in eighth or ninth grade. And no, children would not, didn't know about newspapers, didn't care. I just, for some reason, I was curious. And I would kind of, I can't afford a newspaper, but you know, there would be a newspaper in the shop. And I would kind of go sit down and read it there, <laughs> and then, then go to school. Yeah. Do you remember how you learned to write? Yeah, so basically, the whole school, you know, when I joined the kindergarten, first grade, um, for what I th uh, we didn't even have slates and you know chalk and so on, so you know, it was common practice to kind of make a sand bed, and you learn to write with your fingers, uh, alphabet. You know, so what was your native language? Telugu, Telugu. You know, so. And they were not teaching English in the school at an elementary school or high school, or did you learn English? Yeah, did? no, they, they they taught English. I think even in the primary school, okay. but it, mainly the alphabet and in a few words and so on, and mainly because it's kind of uh, uh, non-native speakers of English teaching other non-native speakers, it was mispronunciation, all kinds of things. But uh, but it was okay. Yep. You know. Were there other members of your uh, of your siblings uh, who went on to uh, to attain a higher education, or were you the first? I was the first and maybe maybe the only one to get a degree. And my elder elder brothers, you know, they're all very smart. Could, could have uh, uh, could have gone to college, but my father said, "Look, somebody has to look after all this property and land, so you're not going to go." So I lucked out. I was the. <laughs> How did he pick you as the person? Because I was the one that was not needed, <laughs> and my younger brother also went to college and graduated, but um, you know, he kind of went back and yeah. into the family. As, as, uh, in, before you went to college, um, do you remember what your favorite subject is or do you remember any interests that were? Oh yes, ma mathematics. It was, it was you know, geometry especially, proving all those theorems and you know. Uh, was it because of a teacher? Do you remember what no. sparked the interest? It was it sparked the interest was sparked by my maternal uncle, who said, "Hey, let me show you this thing," and that was kind of interesting. And then discovering new results, you know, you know, kind of uh, that uh, you know when, when you they have a whole set of problems to solve, you solve them, and that kind of gave you a lot of pleasure that you were able to solve it by yourself. <laughs> And um, uh, did, do you think that um, it was the interest in geometry that led to your study of civil engineering? Was there a, a link to? Yeah, the, basically the link is in those days everybody either did engineering or medicine. And you, that's still the case in, in most. Um, and um, so I could have done medicine probably, but you know. Uh, so when I went to college, after finishing high school, I joined Loyola College in Madras, Chennai. Which is about, how, once again, how far away uh, from your About village? 60 miles, okay. 50, 60 miles. Yeah. And, um, and Loyola College was where, uh, you know, you did what is called the pre-university or intermediate. That's the equivalent of 11th and 12th grades here. And then you essentially did specialized in mathematics, math, physics, and chemistry. So the top, the higher grades of high school, you were already focusing on on, on yeah, math. Yeah, exactly. And were you living away from home? Yeah, I, I've been living away from home at 
from the time I was nine years old because there was no high school in, or even in elementary school. <coughs> <coughs> Education stopped after the primary school. I see, I see. So w tell me about boarding school in a sense. What was it like to be away from your family? The first, you know, four or uh, six years, I was in a small town called uh, about eight miles from the village called um, Sri Kalahasti. And uh, there are no hostels, no boarding, nothing. You know, you, you lived with some family as a paying guest type of thing. And in this case, the family was known. And so they were happy to take me in. You know, it was... Uh, yeah. uh, and as the, the family member who was being educated, did your family take pride in your being away in the big no. city? No. <laughs> <laughs> they, I think it was expected, you know, the, so there was no question of not doing it. You know, all, all my brothers and sisters went to school, but they never went beyond that, yeah. yeah. And would you go home on the weekends, or how often did you, did you stay in touch maybe, with them? Maybe once every two, three months, wow. yeah. not, not on every weekend. Yeah. So you, in that case, your family would become your classmates, in a sense. You would have uh, the people who you were at school with. Right. You, you had a few friends, and you hang, hung out with them, yeah. and there was nothing much to do, you know, other than, yeah. you know. Uh, do you, any chance, did you build any lifelong friendships? Are there people that you remember or are still yes. in touch with from that yes. period? Yes, yes. Two or three of them, yeah, so. Uh, more, more, more friendships come in the college, in Loyola College and Engineering College. Uh, once you there, you know, I, I still meet uh, my classmates yeah. from engineering college. They're all still around. I, I saw the pictures. Um, just before we flew, a little bit more as your time as a child, were there things that you were passionate about besides school? Do you remember having uh, hobbies or things that you remember that you did? Uh, yeah, I, I was not very good at sports or anything. Not that I was not bad, I, you know, I, I, somehow, if I didn't become outstanding in the, within one day of playing hockey, <laughs> I said, oh, it's not me. But most, I li li liked reading. And I, whatever I could get my hands on, you know, I would read, you know. And that was the, from the time I was a, a kid, three, four, five years old. You know, there was, a, even in the village, there was a library um, of maybe 50, 100 books. And I would kind of rummage through them, and uh, that's, you know. Was there any of what we would call science fiction? No. no. So were there classics? They were all classics. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So you had a good sort of uh, education. <laughs> yeah. A self-education, if you want to think of yeah. it. That is, nobody told me to read them. Yeah. It's just that, you know, you're there, and you don't have anything else to do. You, you kind of yeah. yeah. say, I wonder what this book is, you know. <laughs> um, who was the author of... Um, Mowgli and Ricky Tikki Tabby. That's my. That's how I became familiar with India. Um, who was the? I'm blanking on Kip, the name. Kipling. Kipling. Yes. Yeah. Did you stumble across? No. I, yeah. yeah. So, so most of the books I read at that at that time of my life, it was all Telugu books, not English. Yeah. yeah. And to, do you remember making the shift from or beyond? pure math to science and technology. Did you become, before college, did you become, were you interested in science and technology or was it really mathematics? No, so, you know, broadly, almost all the technical subjects I was pretty good at. And, uh, but it was not, I wouldn't call it interest. It was something you, you're supposed to do and you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, um, were there, um, in, 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 when you got to, to study civil engineering at college, um, were there textbooks or other kinds of um, uh, you know, academic material that you encountered that was significant in your development that really stands out in your memory? So there were a lot of textbooks. And, uh, and the way I see that part of my life is uh, it was something I had to do. And I was okay, good at it and okay at it. And I did it, you know, it was not uh, somehow, I did not become passionate about any of those things. Yeah. The time I became passionate is when I got 
introduced to the computer that much later came much yeah. later. Okay, right. we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I understand. Yeah. In high school or in college, were there any mentors or professors that really stick out in your mind? Were there were there teachers that made a difference? Yes, absolutely. There, you know, the the teachers that made a difference came in my graduate school when I was in Australia, okay. and um, you know the, there were two people who I worked with closely, and their claim to fame is they're the first users of computers in civil engineering, and so. I learned my I learned how to program by just following them and in the evening, and um, you know seeing them programming, and then and then I became their programming assistant after a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Um. They were called Stan Hall and Bob uh, Woodhead. I, yeah. yeah. I will. I'll ask you about them uh -huh. spe specifically in just a second. Um, I'd just like to, to jump forward and, so that we don't miss it. Um, uh, would you tell me about your, your current family, your children, spouse? Um, um, yeah. So um, we, I got married to a young lady you know, from my community. Her name is Anu, Anuradha, in 1966. I was already a grad student at Stanford at the time, about to graduate. And then uh, she came hit uh, with me and then we uh, you know I stayed in an apartment building in Palo Alto uh, and then we graduated and then we moved to another apartment <laughs> another house, small house in the college terrace you know oh. you remember the street yeah and uh, uh, Harvard Harvard Harvard, yes. Harvard, <laughs> Harvard, Harvard <laughs> something like that that's something I share we share together when when uh, when I was born, my parents were living on Stanford Avenue in College Terrace. Okay. <laughs> About okay. the time, well, no, it was a little earlier, but anyway, that's not that's not part of it. <laughs> um, so that's good. I'll I'll come back. But um, was your and wife, I, when you say your community, was she from your village area that you grew up? Or no, no. But I, now, you know, you, there's this caste system, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, there are a group of people called Kshatriyas or warriors or something. Within that, there are subcastes and so on. So. Uh, she was about um, 80 miles from uh, from our village, and uh, my my family and their family knew each other, and so there was a kind of a proposal saying, "Would you like to meet?" Yeah. And uh, I said, "I'm right in the middle of my thesis." I so I, I ended up going during the Christmas vacation and uh, meeting her, and and then getting married. And she came back with her. That's, yeah. that's a that's a great story. Very traditional. <laughs> uh, um, and I have two daughters. They were both born here. One of them was born in Stanford at the Stanford Hospital. Other one in Pittsburgh. My younger daughter lives here in Burlingame. My older daughter lives in Los Angeles. Okay. And, uh, okay. I'll I'll come I'll come to back to that. Um, in terms of your college career, uh, you uh, you you were in Air Force ROTC. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about that. So that was one of the exciting parts of the, my, during that period, namely, that was extracurricular. You, you know, you became, uh, the, it was called NCC, National Cadet Corps, uh, Air Wing of the NCC. And so I learned how to fly, you know, at that time as part of that training. And um, so it was kind of exciting to be able to kind of learn to fly and after go solo after 12, 13 hours and then uh, do aerobatics and all those things. You know, that, the, the tiger moths with bi-wing planes. These are propeller-driven planes? Yeah, propeller-driven, but you know, bi-wing planes of the kind that you would see in, in Wright Brothers' movie. You know, you could do aerobatics on it and then loops and you know, turns and everything else. It was exciting. That th those are the things that were kind of re removed you from the tedium of just studying and and taking exams and so on. Yeah. And this is flying at some Air Force field near Madras. Is yeah, that it, was the, it was. It uh, was basically one end of the air, the uh, Madras airport was the uh, private flying club, Madras flying club, and uh, Air Force rented planes and space and pilots from there, and, uh, and you got trained. 
But at that point, you're, you were heading toward becoming a civil engineer. That was yes. your... Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, at, at the people who were your co-students, did they go on to become... Uh, was this, would they go on to do commercial building design? Is, would that be the career path that you would have taken if yeah. you had gone in that direction? So, so many, many of them end up in government service. And in the government service, you might be building dams or infrastructure, roads and buildings and all kinds of things. Or, you know, you, you might end up in, in some other, you know, kind of uh, do postgraduate work and become a professor or something. Yeah. Tell me about how you went from India to Australia for, for graduate school. So it turned out, uh, I graduated from college in 1958, and it turned out they had some internships as part of the Commonwealth. You know, Commonwealth was bigger in those days, and India and Australia were all part of the Commonwealth. So Australia had internships for students from India. So three of us applied and got in, and the three of us went together. Okay. We're all classmates, not in the same field, but different, uh, mechanical engineering, and but uh, and so. Do you remember it as an, ex an exciting uh, v adventure to go to a foreign country? Oh, and absolutely, absolutely. You know, it was compared to the you know sedent you know. The, boring life you know, of just going and studying and taking the exams and so on. Uh, you know, getting, you know, so it turned out that the aircraft, the airfare, uh, if we went, did not fly straight from Madras to Melbourne, uh, the airfare, uh, that we could do, do the same trip with, for two thirds of the price. So in, what we ended up doing was take a ship to Penang, take a train from Penang to Singapore, and then take a plane, right? <laughs> I think it was the best thing we did because it gave you all that experiences which you would never experience if you just got on a plane and got off, right? So do you remember roughly how long it took you to go from Madras to Melbourne? To Penang, yeah. Or, or from, to, to, so from Madras to Penang, it took us like three days. Okay. Uh, one day to go to Singapore, and we stayed there with some friends. And then from Singapore to uh, Melbourne, it was one of those super constellation planes. Okay. And uh, maybe 10 hours or something. Yeah. It, it stopped in between in Darwin and then refueled and went. Was it, um, you'd, you'd already been in a big city for, for college. Coming to Melbourne, what was it like being in a different country? Was it? Was it it, it was really different in the following sense, namely we, the three of us went into this dormitory as part of the interns of University of Melbourne. The, all the kids were there. And uh, this is the first evening. We go into the mess, right? As, Australia is famous for big juicy steaks. We, we read about big juicy steaks, but I've never seen one, right? So. So, and not, not only that, you know, you know, you're a Hindu, you kind of, you know, it's sacred, Kavya sacred and so on. So, the three of us, you know, it was serving steaks that evening. Everybody was kind of going there for seconds and thirds. The three of us looked at it and think, my God, this looks ugly. <laughs> Big piece of <laughs> meat. So, we, that, that evening, we, all we had was bread, butter and jam. <laughs> Because we couldn't, it, it took me like three, four years in Australia to become full, full fledged Australian. A, a Westerner in that, that sense yeah. of the world. Yeah. You know, it, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, now this was, was this a master's program? T tell me what you went to study as part of the I, I just was an intern. Intern means you're just getting experience. Oh. And, um, and so after six months or a year, the question was, what do we do? And um, different people, my, you know, uh, did different things. One of my, my the three of us, uh, one went to England, another went to work in a multinational company in India. I went to University of New South Wales to get a master's degree with Hall and Woodhead. Okay. That's where I got introduced to the computers. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, 
you started, you, did you start during 58 in um, the program, the master's program? Yeah, in 59. 59, okay. Yeah. And uh, it was the University of New South Wales in Melbourne, or did you? Is no, it, it was in Sydney. Sydney, okay. And uh, so the interesting thing was, until that point, I may have read about computers in the newspapers, but it never sank in. I did not have any idea about what a computer was yeah. till in 58. And uh, by 59, I was kind of fully immersed in it. So you come, and your first computer is a mainframe computer? Is a Yeah. Tell so me it, about it, your first it, computer. That's interesting. There's a, it so happens Gordon Bell was also in Australia at the same time. We never ran into it using the same computer. It was called English Electric Juice Mark II. It's a Mercury Delay Line computer. Uh, it was called Deuce because it was a follow-on to ACE. ACE was the computer that Turing designed, and uh, and so uh, and so the, uh, this was a kind of a, the English Electric and a couple of other Ferranti made computers based on the British design, whereas in U.S. we went, used von Neumann computers. Yeah. And so they, they were non von non von yeah. machines. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They they they, they had. The same, and they had memory and instruction set, but whereas in in von Neumann computing, there were instruction and 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 you know, registers and so on. There, in uh, if you look at the architecture of ACE, it's kind of stack oriented. So you never you put things and it becomes a stack, and then you keep adding and then un unstacking them. It's more complicated to think about. But I didn't have to think about it because somebody had already done a high-level language, okay. and it was kind of, it was a matrix, it was the only data structure, and I could just. Do you remember uh, if you had to say the language was like? Was it like any of the other uh, more familiar? Would you remember the yeah, name of the language? Right, or? it was called JIP, you know, okay. uh, something General Interpretive Program or it something like. It was an interpreter. Like, yeah, it was an interpreter. And uh, the closest thing that uh, comes to is APL of Ken Iverson, which is also uses matrix as a basic unit. Yeah. And it was very powerful. I could, you know. And at a, at a, 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 a practical level, how did, w w did you program with cards or how? Or yeah. Put? So first thing you did was you had a paper and you kind of wrote down take this matrix and do this operation with this matrix and, to, and put it in this result, right? That's the standard yeah. um, operator, uh, two operators and an operand and a result. And you write, wrote it down and then you punched it into punch cards and then you put them into a card reader and then you read and do the thing. What would happen is if you are doing a complicated algorithm, there was not enough memory in the computer, right? It's uh, only 1,000 bytes of uh, mercury delay line. So you actually broke it up. You printed out intermediate results and then do a new, uh, another program to take the intermediate results and produce another set of intermediate results. So, and so the, com the punch, card, punch cards were the memory. And if you, if you look at, you know, um, Babbage's computer, that was the same thing. You know, all the me big memory was in punch cards, and uh, everything in the Babbage calculator was only registers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Were the first problems problems of the uh, the social uh, the civil engineering yeah. study? For, yeah. Uh, so it turns out, matrix algebra is very convenient for doing structural engineering problems. Yeah. You can design. It's not not that different than what's happening now with deep learning. You know, you are you have to essentially do a vector multiplication to translate one set of probabilities to another set of probabilities, and so you take all the values and and then multiply by this vector, new vector, and then the results go to the next one. Yeah. Same thing, the same kind of uh, operation. So you were, you were working as a student with a shared machine. Um, right from the beginning, did you have the kind of problems where you would have to wait to get access to the machine? Yeah. How much of the run of the machine did you have? So, the so fortunately, in 59, not many people knew about computers. There were a few, and uh, so, and you kind of signed up saying, I get an hour or a half hour block of time. 
and then you, that during that time you did your ca calculations, and then sign up for some another block of time. So at that point, you talked about your early education in, in math. In terms of to, how much did it parallel the mathematical education you would get today? W w had you already studied calculus and algebra and geometry, so you were, you were well versed in? I, yeah, uh, we went through all of those things. And um, if you asked me exactly what I did I learn, I'd learned a lot. Uh, I got almost perfect score in it and so on. But I, if you ask me, what did I learn? What, you know, what, of, of course, I learned calculus, you know, all, all the things. But if you look at the kind of syllabus and the things that you would learn in, in the 50s, 70 years ago, and the look at the stuff today my grandson is studying, there's a significant difference. Tell me about the two people who you mentioned who were influential, Stan Hall and the other gentleman. Bob Woodhead. Yeah. Bo both of them were computer civil engineers, com uh, computer, uh, civ com computational civil engineering. And they're the first ones they said, oh, I need to do this huge amounts of computation, you know, and I can formulate it as a matrix structures, and um, then I can use a computer to do the uh, results. And the, the, they got went to England on a sabbatical and tra got trained there, and they came back. I was, I was very lucky. I happened to go r about the right time <laughs> with the right people, and um, le learning how to program by learning by uh, by example. It, nobody, they never took a programming course. It was by example. I seeing what they did and how they did it. And, and tell me about living at Sid in Sydney and during that time. Did you, were you so focused on, on the projects that that was your whole life, or did you have any experience in the city? Yeah. It was almost you know, my whole life. But you know, you, you know, the, at that time, uh, the Sydney Opera House was just being built. Every day there was newspaper articles about cost overruns and people would say, why would we hire this architect, he's crazy. <laughs> but uh, that turned out to be a, you know, a fantastic landmark for, for Sydney. And uh, while you were in this graduate program, did you have a fellowship or did you have to work to support yourself while you were studying? I had to support myself. Um, I'm trying to think. Yes. Um, but it it was uh, I had worked as an intern. I had saved up some money, and uh, so was, and that was enough. It was not that expensive. Yeah. Okay. So you could focus on your. I money. I may have gotten an a tuition waiver or something because I was at one of the two top students in the class, yeah. but I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how much were you? Uh, how to what degree were you actually seduced by computing at that point? Did the, the 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 thing about uh, computers was somehow you get instant gratification. You know, you do something, it either works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you say it becomes a challenge, saying debugging, right? That's what Papert and Minsky used to say. You know, learning is debugging. <laughs> well, so at about the same time, so this is the late 1950s, there was uh, around MIT this hacker culture emerging in the good sense of the word. Right. Would you say that you were had a similar experience in the hacker culture? Uh, I'm not sure it happened in '58, '59. It happened in the early '60s. Right. I know um, yeah. Minsky and McCarthy were just there, and uh, Ed Fredkin was there. And there was a fellow called Hank Ernest who built a mechanical hand at that time. And uh, so, so people were kind of saying, what else can you do with computers than just number crunching? And the idea that you could do things that are not conventionally algorithmic, like can you prove a theorem? Can you play chess? You know, you don't think of them in the same way as kind of doing some nuclear code or you know, mathematical solutions, matrix algebra, something. And so those kinds of things kind of led 
these four guys, four people, Minsky, McCarthy, Newell, and Simon, and there was that famous Dartmouth conference in 56, where they, you know, Shannon was there, a number of all the, you know, senior people, and they, they were kind of saying what could, what kind of things, and so their problem was how to define intelligence. Turing had already written a paper on intelligence in the 51 or 52, right. and, they, and they, they were kind of trying to say, fortunately, just before they went to the conference, Newell and Simon were able to write a program that proved a theorem on the computer, produced a theorem and a proof. Of that. Right. And based on that, you know, they, they, they were kind of, so for the first five years or so, until the early 60s, it was all about things that what human beings would think of as being intelligence, you know, proving theorems and and doing other kinds of um, things that, but as you went on, even things like seeing, talking, walking, turned out to be very difficult to do, yeah. and mobility. And after that, you know, other, other problems of uh, uh, kind of, what we used, to, one of the things that was kind of clear at, the, at that point was, you could not think of AI type programming as a conventional, regular step-by-step -step programming, but it is non-sequential. And so Prolog is an example that came out because it was, a, and in most of the early systems, the, but in mathematics, there's a set of things called post-productions. Post-productions were non-sequential. At each step, you say, where am I? What is the state I'm in? If I'm in this state, what should I do? And so, so you have to define preconditions for every action. And you could do conventional math, you know, multiplication also. You say, if I'm in this state, I now need to go to the next state and multiply and add, or whatever. And, but but post-production was a, was a way of defining computation, which is like the Turing machine, like you know, uh, functional programming by um, uh, famous logician to come to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, when you were using uh, computing as a tool for civil engineering problems, did you become exposed to any of the broader computer world outside of that sort of focus in civil engineering that early? Yeah. So basically. That was like a one-year period where I was exposed. Then I had to decide what I'm going to do. I had to get a job. And um, so <coughs> uh, I applied to IBM and uh, got hired. Did you have a degree in civil engineering at this point? Yeah, I only had a degree in civil engineering, but they hired me because I knew what a computer was and had actually programmed one. Right? So this, this would have been 1960? Early 60s, yeah. Early 60s. You were hired by IBM in Australia? Yeah. And they, so then you, they already had mainframes that had been installed in. Yeah, I didn't get to work on mainframes for a year or two, but they, that's, the, that's the first time they were coming out with transistorized mini computers. 1401 and 1620, they were still very expensive, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And the memory capacity of a 1401 was either 4K bytes or 16K bytes. You know. And the interesting thing was, even then, IBM was very clever about marketing. They would say, yeah, 4K bytes, it's 300,000. You want 16K bytes, it's 500,000. And then you say, at, you, at some point, you would run out of space, and they would say, oh, you want six, well, the rest of it? And a, a mechanic would come, and he would turn one screw. The memory was already there. It, they didn't want the hassle of going and installing new memory. It was all built in, and and the, it it was very clever marketing. I thought, you know, so at that time. So, what was your first job at IBM? I became what did they call an applied science representative because I had technical background, 
Uh, but, uh, you know, you kind of did whatever had to be done. Was it a customer-facing role where you would actually go to the customer premises or? I did, but more as a technical support, as a system. I was not a salesman, yeah. but. Um, so these were early engineering and scientific applications exactly. of IBM computers. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember yeah. the companies that were customers by any chance? Ford Motor was one of them. In Australia? In Australia. Oh. They had in Geelong or someplace, Ford Motor was manufacturing cars you know, at that time, and so did General Motors and so on, but I didn't work with General Motors, so. And do you remember, the, were the problems production-oriented or design-oriented, were they? Were Basically, it was databases. It was, it was mainly supply chain management, and that's what we now call it. In those days, we didn't use that word. Yeah. They just needed to make sure that all the parts all the components were there in the right time at the right place yeah. so that they could manufacture them. The logistics of getting them there. Yeah. So h how many years did you spend it? Were you at yeah. IBM for the entire period before? Yeah, I was there for about uh, three and a half years, okay. almost four years. So uh, from all of 60, 61, 62, 63 September, I went to Stanford. And so tell me about the, 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 the thought process that led you to decide you wanted to get a graduate degree and what, yeah. what was going on in your so world. I, I already got a, a, a master's degree in MTAC in civil engineering. And once I started working at IBM, and at the early on I said maybe I'll do a PhD, but it, it was not clear what I was doing. Within a year it was clear I, I'll never go back to civil engineering complete switch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was fortunate in that because at that time, there was not that much to learn in computer science compared to what it is now. And so I, I could essentially learn everything pretty fast and, and, and become as good as anybody else. Yeah. And so uh, I said if, you know, if I'm going to do a PhD, I might as well do it in, in uh, computer science. And then you looked around, why Stanford? I applied to two places, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, because those are the only places that had AI. Uh, and you know, MIT also had it, but I didn't apply there. And uh, Stanford accepted me, and Carnegie Mellon put me on some waiting list or something. They didn't have a computer science program at that time. And uh, so I would have... Stanford's, what year did Stanford's CS program start? It was... In 65. And 60, you came to Stanford in 64? 63. 63. They already had a program in computer science as part of the math department. George Forsyth, you know, the, the university recognized that we, they, had to, they had to do something in computing because already, if you'd remember, from ENIAC, which is 1944-45, to early computers, you know, UNIVAC and so on, in the early 51, Already, you know, for 15 years, computers were in the news, were being used. And so everybody saw this is the up and coming area. And so Stanford and Carnegie Mellon had computer science programs, but at that time they didn't know what to call them. So they basically said, uh, we'll set up a program in, in, in the case of uh, uh, Stanford was in math department because most of the computing was being done in numerical analysis. At, at CMU, because of Simon and all the decision making stuff was in business school, so the first computer came into CMU business school. And so, but in both places it was obvious this is something uh, they, they, uh, bigger than either department and uh, so <clears throat> I think the, the, in the community there was the, a thing called AFIPS, yep. uh, a regular conference, an annual conference. That it, I think it started in 1961 or something where people would come and they would kind of discuss and kind of at some point they said we should set up a department in, uh, in both places maybe. Where they, they were the, one of the first few. But while you were at IBM and you were looking to go to graduate school, somehow artificial intelligence became an interest. And that yeah. was important in your selection of those. Right. How did you learn about the field of artificial intelligence? Because, like I said, I, I like to read whatever I get my hands on. I was in the, in, at IBM, 
I was reading papers on operations research and reading papers on Monte Carlo methods, all kinds of things. And then I said, you know, and then I was reading papers on artificial intelligence. And I said, my gosh, you know, I wonder if it is really possible. If it is, I should be right, right there. And that's how I, you know, so I, I knew I just wanted to do new. Yeah. Do you think it's possible that you would run across Turing's paper by that time? The, no. The original paper no. that he wrote in 51. No. So it was not. No, it was. Uh, I had read you know, Newell and Simon's papers, and I read McCarthy's papers, ah, but okay. uh, not Turing's. The Turing's paper appeared in some, I think, either Nature or some one of the journals in British journals. And as usually, you know, uh, I, I should have seen it, but it was not that good. Uh, and it's interesting to me that even though you were sort of still in the Commonwealth co community at that point, and you might have thought about going to, to England, you, you didn't. You because I was working for IBM. Oh, that's right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, even then, U.S. was the center of the computing, right? Yeah. There were a lot more, many more computers and many more people working on it. Yeah. Whereas in Britain, uh, they were always kind of stepchildren. You know. So you arrive in, in Palo Alto at Stanford. Um, how did you come to be McCarthy's um, student? Yeah, I, when I came in, I already knew I wanted to do AI. And I said, that's what I want to be. And I was assigned McCarthy as the advisor. Ah. And, and so this, once again, this is 63. Three. 63. So, um, uh, he is just starting the Stanford AI lab at that point. Right. Maybe was it '62 that yeah, he started? No, yeah, he, he yeah he also came out just about that time. Yeah. You know, maybe six months earlier than me. Uh, and at that time, you know, Stanford only had numerical analysis, George Forsyth and so on, and George, uh, Harriet. And so when he came in, you know, you know, he was setting up the thing, and that was when Licklider went to DARPA. And he was, he, you know, was trying to see who he should fund in this new field uh, of, you know, computing, and that that came about because of Sputnik and all those things. Right. And so, he, he, he Lick, Lick Licklider did an amazing thing. You know, he already had a big picture of what the, he had seen, what would happen with Vannevar Bush and all the, you know, Second World War. MIT was the center of a lot of this innovation. And so he went to DARPA and was able to immediately say, let me fund the three centers that where, where key people are. So he funded Stanford, he funded Carnegie Mellon, he funded uh, MIT. Yeah. And at that point, uh, you had not moved to a rest there or road at that point. You were still on campus, is that true? Yes. So uh, we were on campus in Polia Hall, you know, yeah. and uh, and then the comp all the computers were next to it in Pine Hall, and uh, it turns out uh, the big computer was Burroughs at that time. Everybody was using it, and McCarthy got the first PDP one, maybe first or second that deck ever made, and it was all by itself, and there were people like Steve Russell and others building time-sharing you know, systems on top of it and so on. And, and the interesting thing was all of them had the American work ethic, right? They would come in the morning, work till five, and then go, <laughs> go and do other things. I would do just the opposite. I would come at four in the evening, talk to them from six in the evening till eight in the morning. I would work on the computer. And I thought I died and went to heaven because in those days, the time on even PDP-1 was like $1,000 an hour. So every day I was burning like $10,000 to $15,000 an hour. You basically had an early personal computer. Absolutely. I, and nobody else there. Yeah. And the only other person that occasionally wandered in was John Chowning. He was a professor. In, at that time, he was just a researcher in music. And he was trying to synthesize music. Yeah. Uh, there, there's an example. For example, people that conventionally used computers didn't think using computers to generate music was not seen as conventional computation. Right. 
but it was seen as part of AI. You know, if a computer can generate music just like you and me, hey, that's intelligence. <laughs> And, and uh, was Russell's uh, time-shared implementation, implementation working then so that you oh, and yeah. Chowning could share? It was not already working. He was doing it simultaneously. Yeah. But I, I was only using it as a standalone you know, yeah. personal computer. Yeah. I didn't need the time-sharing. Do you remember, um, besides Chowning, do you remember any of your classmates um, in that very early period? Sure, yeah. The two people that are still you know, kind of well-known is... Um, Bill McKeeman, he was, uh, you know, the two of us graduated together. He's a good, very good friend. And the other person was Cleve Moeller. He was my office mate. Okay. He was in numerical analysis. Cleve then went off and became professor in Arizona or something and did this math lab, you know, math pack. And uh, that became math lab and math works. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. There is an example of an amazing career where for the first 20 years, he was just a professor and then suddenly um, they did a very clever thing. Unlike other computer companies, they never took it public. Even today, you know, they probably make a few hundred million dollars of profit. It's just distributed among the founders and a lot of it is just given as bonuses to the employees. Yeah. Tell me your first impressions of McCarthy when you came to Stanford. No, uh, McCarthy even then had a beard and was, you know, kind of, uh, he was kind of dreamy. He was kind of somewhere mm -hmm. else, you know. Uh, but, you know, he, 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 the first thing was I had to say, John, I came here to do AI. I don't want to do numerical analysis. He says, but that's required. You have to do it. So I did, you know, take Gene Gallo's course in numerical analysis. As history would have it, out of the seven or eight students of McCarthy, every one of them failed that course, except me, you know. And so in the faculty meeting, <laughs> McCarthy said, Nobody wanted to take your course. You know, we should eliminate it. He said, and, and so Gene apparently said, that's surprising. Raj Reddy came to me at the end of the course and said he liked it. <laughs> I got an A. And it, so it, it turned out both were true. It's what we now call, we call non-monotonic logic. At the beginning, something is true, including me, I didn't want to take. I said, OK, if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it at the end. I, I, I enjoy it, you know, learning new stuff that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Yeah. Um, coming to, to Stanford in the early 60s, um, you worked in the evenings on computing, but do you remember much about the community or did you get involved in any of the things that were not related to the AI lab? Yeah, I, I know, I knew most of the people in computer science. There was a small department that time. And, you know, and, um, but, I did not know much about the rest of the Stanford community. You know, for example, uh, I only went to one football game in my whole six years or something at Stanford. And, and when I first came in, it was not something on my horizon that I would attend any of those games, right? Whereas if you're an honest, you know, red blooded Amer American student, that was part of your culture. You, you went to football games and basketball games and everything, and they would stand up in long queues get to get the season tickets and so on. That was a big deal at that point. Yeah, it it's probably still is. <laughs> it is. Um, did you live on campus when you first arrived? I'm trying to think. Yes. Okay. I, I lived on campus for two or three, three years. Okay. There's, there's still a building called Barnes Hall or something. That was one of the places. You know. yeah. Before that, you know, the, the uh, living, you know, there was not enough space for all the students. So graduate students were told to go find their own, right? Yeah. But there were some graduate student housing, so we I stayed there. And when did the move to Arrested Era Road for the Stanford AI Lab happen? Was it fairly soon in your... It was 65. So a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
And did that mean at that point did you have to have a car to to get around, or how did you yeah. get out to? So I did have a car. So it turns out, because I had worked for IBM and so on, I did have enough money to buy a car, and um, so I did. You know, so and um, uh, so. And Gene used to say, you're the only student I know that has a car or something. You know, you know. But, um, and did you, did you look around in the, the Bay Area at all? Did, like, did, would you, on, on your free time, would you drive to San Francisco at all? Or did any of that interest you? Or were you very focused on computing? Yes and no. I mean, basically, I went to San Francisco once or twice. You know, whereas... My, my colleague and, fr and a friend, G Ed Feigenbaum, who was on the faculty, would go to his weekend house in San Francisco or on the, on the other, uh, Half Moon Bay or something, yeah. not Half Moon Bay, on the other side of the um, oh, Golden so Gate Sausalito Bridge. Or, Sausalito. Sausalito. Yeah. And so, so I, and then he would come back and say uh, how wonderful it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, so, was Feige, you arrived before Feigenbaum, did, did, didn't you? Yes. He came yes. a couple of years later. He, he came a year or so later. He was already a PhD, yeah. was on the, at Berkeley as an assistant professor, yeah. and he came in as an associate professor to Stanford, yeah. and, he, and he was on my thesis committee. Also. So you were involved in two early communities that are very interesting. Um, one was um, the sale community, right. and the other was the broader ARPA community. Right. Um, when did you start? I, there are these famous ARPA meetings yes. where the graduate students would go along too. Did you go to any of those early meetings? And do you have any memories of? I went to them as a young faculty member. After I graduated, I became an assistant professor at Stanford. Yeah. And that was the time when we were just coming. ARPANET was just getting built in 1968, yeah. 67, 68. And there were kind of meetings and would have, and everybody would come to Stanford and we would all have a big meeting from, and, and Marvin Minsky came and spent a year in 1964, 65. Uh, so I think the move to Rastadero happened middle of 64, I think, 60, September 64. Yeah. It was, it was called the DC Power Building, and yeah. you got to operate, o occupy about a half of it or something? Right. And had Les Ernest showed up to manage it by then? You know, it was, Les Ernest came even before, okay. uh, but the reason was, you know, at that time it was, Ivan Sutherland was the head of DARPA, and then, um, uh, Licklider came and... Uh, Licklider, Ivan Sutherland, oh, Bob Roberts. Hill. Roberts. Uh, Roberts, Larry Roberts, yes. Larry Roberts. And I, I went and Larry decided John McCarthy cannot manage millions of dollars and keep track of all the, you know, he, he, he's a great scientist, but as a manager of day-to-day -day details of the thing, they would fall through the cracks, and uh, DARPA needed all kinds of reports and everything. And so... Lick, uh, uh, Les Ernest, you know, they had known him at um, Lincoln Labs together. He worked on handwriting and various other things. He's an you know, amazing scientist by in his own right, but he's also a good administrator. So he came, became the executive director. Yeah. Um, two, two questions. What was it like to be McCarthy's graduate student? And also, how did you come to that early interest in speech as a research area. Yeah. So the great thing about McCarthy is he's, he kind of let you do whatever you want. <laughs> and he would kind of suggest some things. And the, one of the suggestions was, hey, we just got this computer. It has an everyday converter, and you can digitize speech. Maybe one of the students can build a speech recognition. So I said, I'll do it, you know, and that's how I got into it. Uh, and so that was, at that point, you, had anybody else done research in the field? Was How brand new was it at that point? It was brand new to me because I didn't know of anybody else doing the research. And later on I discovered Bell Labs had a large group of people that have studied speech from the 30s 
They were playing speech coding. Mostly they were in the coding and compression. Uh, but um, Peter Danish, um, there were one, peop one or two people that built speech recognition things, word digit recognizers, mm -hmm. uh, using computers in the uh, 61 time frame. Um, and then um, at some point, I, I, I'm, I'll remember the name, um, the senior d director of DARPA, uh, uh, Bell Labs, decided we sh they shouldn't be doing speech recognition. They stopped. And th that kind of set them back a little bit until Flanagan and uh, Larry Rabiner came and started it up again, and Vishnu at all. So um, the first, uh, tell me a little bit about um, the, sort of the nitty gritty of your early speech work and what you focused on and uh, yeah. what you so basi were. Yeah, basically, uh, r right from the beginning, I come from Indian language, Sanskrit, and so on, right? They're all phonetically based. You speak what you write, and you write what you speak. And uh, so from that point of view, one of the first things you, you learn there is all the alpha vowels. And then once you've learned the vowels, then you take the consonants and kind of say, they can be modified by the vowels, or the vowels can be added to the consonants. So, a uh, ah, uh, and then ka, and uh, and ga, and those are stops, and then cha, and ta. So they all have the same vowel, but different consonants. And uh, in Indian language, all the consonants are organized together, and that you learn them, and they are either aspirated or unaspirated. You know, so if you're a linguist, you would know all this. I was not a linguist. I was <laughs> came from a different culture. <coughs> but I invented for myself the same kinds of things. I said, let me see if I can recognize vowels as the first thing. And I built a pretty good working vowel recognizer. And you did it all the way from the hardware up to the, was it? No, the, the hard, hardware was already there, the A to D converter. And I had help, I think, you know, like Steve Russell or somebody, wrote the, uh, the low-level sampling things, so I could call the subroutine, and would, which would sample whatever and it was being said, like you, know, you, yeah. you start and stop, and then you get the, the thing, there's a waveform, and then you decide what you do, do with it. Yeah. And, and um, at that point, you know, there's this famous story about um, an MIT graduate student who was assigned computer vision as a summer research project, because they didn't realize, apparently, at the very beginning how hard the problem would be. Yes. Did, what was your thought about how complex speech would be? So, um, yeah, the, 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 I think that, that, that is par for the course. Every, all of us in AI thought we were kind of wildly optimistic with no basis, you know, saying, oh, we, we should be able to do all of this, and in fact, if you take Marvin Minsky, and he said, yeah, let's build a Mars rover, and we'll build it, design it, and build it in, the, in 64, 65, and we can put it on a satellite to, to Mars, and it will go around and, uh, and be a Mars rover in uh, 67. So we started working on those kinds of things. You know, um, If you remember, at SRI, they were working on Shaky. Shaky. And at, at Stanford, at uh, AI Labs, they were working on hand-eye coordination and picking up things and... Which led to one of the first yeah. robot arms? Yeah, robot arms. Yeah. And um, uh, Rick, Rick Scheinman was the guy that was there and designed all of those things. Yeah. And um, so the range of activities at Stanford at that time are kind of broad, you know, all the way from vision and robotics to speech and language. And, uh, you know, even then, you know, Roger Shank was there and Ken Colby was there. Roger and, and Ken were trying to understand language in the specific context of can you understand paranoid behavior, right? Perry, you know. Very, and, and so, had Eliza already been done on the East Coast? Yeah, Eliza has done. been done, but except it was 
not true understanding of language. It was looking at some couple of keywords and then responding. And uh, we did that kind of a thing, you know, where it turns out uh, we had a, a fast forward 20, 20 years, 30 years. Turned out we had a, a video interview like we're doing now of Arthur Clarke that was done by WQED in, in Pittsburgh. And so we said, let us build a synthetic interview system so that wouldn't it be great if your great-grandchildren could talk to Arthur Clarke or Einstein and ask him a question and they would answer. And the answer is, they, they would just take a couple of keywords and, in, and find anything that he said in, uh, using those keywords. And then he says, huh. And then, uh, and then he would say something. There's some link, but it has nothing to do with understanding it. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, did speech become the, the sort of the principal thread of your graduate studies? Yes. And did it lead to your dissertation? Yes. Okay. So that was my th uh, PhD thesis. And uh, Describe a little bit of your PhD. What problem were you trying to solve when you... I was trying to understand the connected speech recognition okay. and, and then you apply it to... Um, some application like hand-eye system controlling some computer with the voice. And uh, all of that, um, we were, were very good at even in those days. Fortunately, we have a video record. Uh, we made a little documentary. The, the, the first documentary was called Here, Here, Here. H-E-A-R. H-E-A-R, H-E-R-E. Okay. Here, Here. Yeah. And, um, and I believe it's in YouTube, you'll you'll find it if you know, because we put all the videos we did over the period of time, and um, that was done by the Stanford Communication Department. They needed some project to do it. They came and then we said, okay, why don't you do this? And there, not only did we show that it could recognize speech, then you could say, pick up the red block on the bottom right corner, and then the hand would go and then pick it up and so on. So this was something we actually demonstrated and gave a, a talk on AFIPS 1968, about the same time that Engelbart was doing his thing. <laughs> this was actually two sessions parallel. I said, I wanted to go see that too, but I couldn't. I you had were making a presentation. To make a presentation. <laughs> but that, you know, it was an exciting time at that time. You know. That's very, very powerful. What was it like, you know, in that period, well, I guess it was later on. Um, as the AI lab evolved, there became a kind of a counterculture culture that was part of the lab that became very famous when Stuart Brand wrote about it in the early 1970s. That right. was later. But, you know, Les Ernest put a, didn't he put a sauna in the basement and people were living in the attic? Did, were you aware of that? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I thought it was okay, you know, but, you know, it was not something I would have done. But uh, when I saw, you know, there were, you know, Gary Feldman and a few other people. They essentially made a, a hole and got up into the attic of the thing and made a little, you know, living space for themselves. And um, and uh, so there were all, you know, that was the time. It, it was the 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 height of hippie culture, right? Yeah. Sixty-five to seventy, you know, and um, and so. It, it was not that blatant at, at, at AI labs, but I think you know people were relaxed and they were not kind of, uh, and so, so so much so. Uh, my my favorite story of that of that era is the best advice I ever got was from my classmate Bill McKeeman. So I was all ready to go try LSD, <laughs> and uh, and you know I was invited to some LSD party. I said, yeah. Bill, I'm going to go to this party. You know, this it'd be interesting. He looked at me, and he said, you know, shook his head, and then he was kind of trying to see how to convince me not to go. He said, you know, it might be interesting to kill somebody too. You don't want to do that. Let somebody else do it and then learn from it. I think that was the best. I never did go yeah, yeah. because obviously, you know, there are things that you don't know how what the, yeah, the impact yeah, will can, have. It can, um, were you aware, uh, roughly the same time, there was work going on to build a speech interface to Shaky, 
Yeah. Were, were, were you aware of their work? And were they, yeah. did you ever? Yeah, Stanford, Stanford and uh, uh, SRA and Stanford had, you know, cl close working relationship. There was uh, Marty Tannenbaum, uh, you know, who was working on vision, who was a graduate student in the Stanford lab, but he was also working for SRI. So there are a number of people back and forth, you know, Peter Hart and Nels Nelson and so on. But, you know, but basically uh, at that point, you know, they had kind of carved out something they wanted to do because the DARPA would say, look, we, don't, we want you to tell us what you want to do and we'll fund you for that. Yeah. And at, at uh, Stanford, it was a it was a kind of a, a center of excellence grant yeah. where you could do anything you want. That was the difference. Where at SRI they would say, okay, we're going to fund you some of these things. Whereas at Stanford, anything that anybody thought of could be done. During the period when you were a graduate student, did you publish papers or give talks? What was the culture like? Um, how how did you share your research as you went along? Yeah, there were two or three papers I published at that time. One was by myself, that was just in the Journal of Acoustical Society of America, and one, in the, one was in CACM, and uh, one was at AFIPS. Okay. So the AFIPS was actually a joint paper because it involves Hand Eye and Les Ernest and McCarthy, all of us were co-authors at that time. Whereas some of the other papers were just narrow defining how to detect pitch periods or something. Yeah. It's just a technique. And so, but um, the most interesting part of that time and is going to this two or three conferences. You know, there was a conference um, in Los Angeles, the first conference where the first Turing Award was given in 1966. Uh, Alan Perlis was the first recipient of the Turing Award. He's from Carnegie Mellon. And I was still a student. And uh, McCarthy, I said, can I go to this conference? He said, sure. You know. So he sent me to Los Angeles. And uh, it was great. You know. and, then the, uh, and then the following year, or maybe even the same year, there was another conference in Boston. Uh, where Danny Barbara presented his paper, and uh, Bert Raphael he presented his paper on AI problem solving. And there were all kinds of exciting things going on on both sides of the, on uh, both coasts. Yeah. And um, so the interesting thing to me was to kind of get a big picture saying, what is all happening? How do we find out everything? And there was no place to go to kind of get a big picture saying, here are all the major advances that have happened, and here's what it means. In an early book, Hans Morvek, in the introduction, talked about the optimism in the field, and I think the thing that he said that in 62, when McCarthy first applied for ARPA funding, he thought that building a thinking machine might take a decade in that proposal. Do you remember that level of optimism at that, at yeah. that point, that it mm -hmm. seemed like? It was, uh, so, we, when we hear those things, we believe it too. So, and a, another one was, Herb Simon said, there'll be a chess machine that'll be, uh, beat the world champion in 10 years. And so a number of these kinds of things where we thought you could build a speech recognition system maybe in 10, 15 years, and vision and everything, ev every area that we were touching. And, um, we just did not understand the complexity, yeah. and we did not have the computing power. Were you aware, while you were a graduate student, of the early work that had been done on neural nets and perceptrons? And did you think about, were they current enough that you thought about the possibility of using them in speech? Yeah. Right. No, the, the, the perceptrons, you know, kind of learning machines and so on, were there. I think Rosenblatt, or, Rosenblatt or, or, Ken, Ken did Rosenblatt. the early work. and. Somehow, the complexity of speech and complexity of vision seemed so complicated, trying to do it with single neurons or kind of thing didn't seem to be clear. But 
the idea that you might want to use learning, machine learning, uh, was there. So if you read uh, Minsky's paper of 63, Steps Towards AI, there's a whole section on machine learning and uh, reinforcement learning, all the different kinds of things. And uh, Art, Art Samuels, who built the chess machine, who was also on the faculty, who was there at uh, Stanford Labs, also did, uh, you know, trained the system using the, the data set. Yeah. And was there a lively discussion, you know, today, the entire society is engaged in discussion of AI and its impact on society. You were there right at the beginning of the research projects in the 60s. Were you already starting to think about the impact of these technologies on society at that point? So, the, the, I think all of us did not think AI is going to be turned into a bad science, right? You know, the, even now, I don't think it's going to happen. That's a discussion we can have later. But, um, but the right answer to it is, I think either Newell or Simon said to me, he said, they said, every science, everything you do will have good aspects to it and bad aspects to it. You cannot not do it and Simon's statement was, knowledge is better than no knowledge. You should know, and so if you don't have that knowledge, and some other country, Russia, China, goes and creates the knowledge, then you'd be blindsided. So in that sense, it has to be done. The question is, it has some potential for negative use. And that's always been the case for every technology that was invented. Um, tell me about uh, receiving your PhD and then going on to be um, a faculty member at, at Stanford. Yeah. So basically, I, you know, uh, I finished my PhD. Bill McKeeman and I finished uh, together. We were two of the four, four that started the, the was first that batch. 67 then? 66. So just in three years. It was years. very three years. Yeah, very and, quick. And, um, and, uh, the, and the interesting thing was, so I had my orals in the morning, and Bill had it in the afternoon. So I say, Bill, I, I was the first PhD. And he says, look at the graduation list. Bill McKeeman is first, and then Raj Reddy. <laughs> so we, we both graduated together. You know. okay. so and and we, uh, you were hired as a? a both of us. Yeah. Both, I mean, basically, the Forsyth needed young faculty members to kind of teach the courses and so on. So he hired two of his own graduates, Bill McKeeman and, and me, and um, and then he hired uh, David Grease and Jerry Feldman. And as history would have it, none of us stayed back. Yeah. And uh, and in, in my case, I almost stayed back. It turns out Stanford has a policy saying you cannot hire your own PhDs. MIT is just the opposite policy. They'll hire their own PhD, right? And so, in the in this case, uh, the dean said, "Hey, George, you know this is George Forsyth. I already made an exception to for you to hiring Raj as an assistant professor. Now you want to promote him? Let him go somewhere, and then and then he can come back after a year. Yeah. So, the, and uh, that's what happened." Yeah. The department you know, unanimously recommended me for promotion after three years. And then I ended up you know, leaving, yeah. never came back. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, but I wanted to ask if you remember any of your undergraduate students or any of your students from that, from that time period that you taught at Stanford. Yeah, um, yeah. For so example, many, did, yeah. did Larry Tesler take any classes from you? He no, was a, Larry was there. He was working with uh, Roger Shank and, 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 uh, and Colby. Uh, there were a number of people, Lee Ehrman, Rick Hayes-Roth, who ended up at HP and Monterey, Victor Lesser, who is now a uh, senior professor at UMass, and all of them were students here, and then some of them had not finished when I left, so they came to uh, CMU, and 
and were, finished up their thesis, got the degree from Stanford. Okay. Do you remember what your teaching responsibilities were when you first began teaching? Yeah, mostly you know, prog introduction to programming. Yeah. And, and what was it, what were the fashionable languages? And at that point, how how did you teach people to program? It was all you know, in a Lisp or Fortran or Algol. When we were not using Fortran, by then Algol was the respectable language. <coughs> we had Klaus Wirth, um, who got his uh, Turing Award in eighty four, eighty six. But this was before Pascal, wasn't it? Or this was before Pascal. Yeah. And uh, so he was there, and uh, and then I think he did Algol W or something, and you know so he was there for three years or something before he left for Switzerland. Okay. And um, so you almost ended up going to Berkeley, is that right? Yeah. As a, so tell me about yeah. It. Basically, when the dean uh, Hasley Royden. Um, uh, Math, mathematical professor at Stanford, he may still be there, I don't know, he might have retired, <laughs> said, look, let him go for a year. And so I, I started looking, applying. So I, the two places, uh, there are other places also, but I wasn't interested, uh, was uh, Berkeley, and they made, a, made me an offer and uh, as a tenured associate professor. But it took them a long time. Like you know, you, you had to go through the normal process, like maybe four months or six months. And then uh, Feigenbaum mentioned to Newell saying, "Hey, Raj looks like he's going to go to Berkeley." And then Newell called me up and said, "Why don't you come to CMU for a day, and then then you can decide you know, if you want to come here." So I went there for one day. I remember it was like Wednesday evening. I land landed there. I met with. Newell, Simon, and Perlis on Thursday, and Friday morning I got an offer. It was that fast. Everything was, you know, so that impressed me. <laughs> I said, but more than that, I wanted to work with Newell and Simon. Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, and so at this point, you were married, and had you already had children? Uh, my yeah, I had one daughter. Uh -huh. My Shamla was born here in '67. So. She was like three years old or two years old when we left. Yeah. We and and so you arrived in the fall of 60 Nine. 69. So the weather was okay when you first came to Pittsburgh. Right. What was it like learning to live through? No, we first we had a great time. We drove across the country. That's the first time we got to see. We went to you know Yellowstone and Badlands and down Nebraska and everywhere else, and it was really great. And uh, so, yeah, great. Um, so, um, before w you, you're just making this transition to CMU, but b before we leave Stanford, there were uh, some other questions that I had to um, uh, that I wanted to ask you. And um, we did you watch the process of the creation of the computer science department at Stanford? And do you sure. have your memories about that yeah. process? Yeah, in, in particular. At that time, there was a lot of debate about what computer science was. There was a famous paper by Newell, Simon, and Perlis that appeared. They said, computer science is the phenomena around computers. You know, we do all kinds of things, and what, uh, all the things that we're doing, design of computers, algorithms of computers, and <coughs> you know, applications of computers. You know, that becomes the science of the phenomenon. You know, so basically, uh, and that was what was published. I had a very different view, which I still I, you know, think is right, but I was just a student. <laughs> so what I said was the role of computing is analogous to fields of engineering and medicine. You know, Engineering is a field devoted to enhancement of the physical capabilities of human beings. You know, if, you, if you can't fly, you build a plane. And so, and medicine is a field devoted to uh, repairing the human being. Computer science to me was 
field devoted to enhancing the mental capabilities. Anything that you do with your brain, a computer can be used to enhance it. That was my you know, thesis. I think it is still more or less correct. Yeah. But um, at that time, it probably either looked too grandiose <laughs> or whatever. Got, you know, Gottlieb, uh, who was the, uh, the uh, editor at that time. If your view had been taken seriously at that point, do you think the field would have developed in a different way? No. No. Now basically, the great thing about uh, the, uh, the people that were there at that time, they had that expansive view. Anything goes. You know, if somebody wanted to come and do music, they could do that. If somebody wanted to build, you know, a paranoid diagnostic machine, they could do that. Any, any, in that sense, they did not limit what you could and could not do within computer science. Yeah. And in that sense, while you were a graduate student, while speech was your focus, to what extent did you dabble in other areas ranging from, did you do any robotics work as a graduate student? Did you do any vision work as a graduate student? I did not do any robotics work, okay. but I did do vision work. Most of the vision work at Stanford Labs was around hand-eye systems and a robot vision, vision for robotics. I said there are other aspects of vision. So there, there was a thesis of a student that was, you know, at that time, on face recognition. Was this Mike Kelly? Mike Kelly. And, um, and it turns out, you know, about the same time, Takeo Kanadi did a face recognition thesis. His work was much, much better. I guess when I saw, I saw it, I said, yeah, this is great. And um, so we hired Takeo, you know, a few years later. But, um, but uh, so basically, there, I think there was one or two others also at that time. Um, <clears throat> when I went to st uh, CMU, I continued working in speech and, and vision. And uh, robotics thing was something I knew, you know, I kind of grew up with it and in that sense that we knew it can be done, it needs to be done. And that's how we ended up creating the Robotics Institute. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted, before we leave also, I believe the paper that you, you talked about um, uh, related to the Joint Fall Computer Conference in 68 was called A Computer with Hands, Eyes, and Ears. Um, and that was a, a joint paper with McCarthy and Ernest and yeah. and and just because it's become it was such a, a powerful moment in history the fact that you guys were giving that paper at the same time <laughs> right. that Doug was giving his right and I know that Les Ernest is very um, bitter about this he feels that the field didn't give your project enough credit what did it look like to you at the time no, it's not uh, no I'm not sure it didn't give any cre enough credit. <clears throat> what Doug was showing was very powerful vision of how human-computer collaboration could happen, how people could do things with the use of computers. Whereas AI Labs was primarily thinking about what can a computer do, not what a human and a computer do. I now believe <clears throat> for the next 10, 20, 50 years, it is the, the paradigm of human computers together doing things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think uh, it is sometimes, some people call it, IBM people call it augmented intelligence instead of AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And my view is <clears throat> there'll always be, I think there's this 80-20 rule or a 90-10 rule that I talk about where you can, there are certain things human beings are good at doing and machines are not yet good at doing. There are many things that machines can do just well. So w what we should do is get the machines to do 90% of day-to-day of -day work and the human beings would do the 10% that the machines cannot do. So the net effect is you and I would be able to be 10 times more efficient. 
I can do one day's work in one hour. And so I think that is probably the likely paradigm for the, ne for the next 10, 20 years or 50 years that also kind of has the same seed, namely. The thing that scares most people is if a robot can do everything, what will people do? And if the same scare should be there for the other one also. If robots will do 90% of what we do, 90% of the jobs will be gone. Then what will people do? Yeah. And I think, you know, so the 90-10 or 80-20 is more likely to happen and uh, will in fact improve productivity and all kinds of things. And uh, rather than uh, an AI system doing everything by itself. Yeah. Also, before leaving Stanford, I wanted to ask you, <coughs> you step back, and you had to say, during that period of my career, my intellectual influences. What, 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 what would you identify as your key intellectual influence during that period? Either a person or ideas. What, what really drove your in the, so, the so development? Basi yeah, basically. That was the kind of a beginning of computer science. You could do almost anything. I, I, I feel bad for the current graduate students. Lots of things have already been done. At that time, you could touch anything and it, it kind of became uh, important. Yeah. And did it have that feel, did the feel of a wide open? Wide open yeah. feel, yeah. Yeah, that's very and exciting. There were not that many people working and people and, and, and during that period, how influential was DARPA first at Stanford and then when you first arrived at ZMU? Was it instrumental to your development? Yeah, extremely important. Namely, without DARPA and the funding, the field would not have gone anywhere. The ARPANET would not have happened. The robotics would not have happened. And uh, yeah. speech, vision, all of which are now turning out to be major applications, you know, would not have happened. The, in retrospect, the fact you can do computer su su supported CSCW cooperative work of that Engelbart was proposing um, has not created as much long-term impact as the speech, vision, search engines, and all the other things have. And that's probably as it should be, namely, <coughs> and this, the, the, another, one of the bets I took was, I said, when we look back in 20, 30 years, it will be seen that AI was more important than the invention of transistor. Everybody laughed and they said, no, that's crazy. Yeah. So, it, so again, it's, it's one of those things that's unwinnable. How do you define which is more important? But um, in retrospect, today, given all the hype about AI, I think if all the things that we're thinking about and come to pass, it may be the most important technology we have ever invented. Yeah. That doesn't mean all the other things are not necessary. They are necessary foundation to do the AI. You can't do AI without all the rest of it. Right. But uh, all that it says is we are able to create superhuman intelligence. Yeah. When you can create superhuman intelligence, that will probably lead to things that, you know, I think Harari has it right, namely, we might end up having intelligent design. Yeah. Yeah. In 1968, when that, that paper uh, mm. was, was uh, presented, a computer with hands, eyes, and ears, did you have that big vision at that point that uh, the, the, you just yeah, yeah. described it was already part of your sort of... Yeah, basically, the, the, the fact that we said hands, eyes, and ears, it, we are kind of getting to a system where it would have human-like capabilities. Yeah. 
not human capable, human like, right? So the question was, uh, how important is it? At that time, it was not clear. You know, it would happen, and and when it would happen, and how complicated it would be. Even 30 years later, in 2000, year 2000, if you asked me, I would say, speech recognition from open population, unrehearsed spontaneous speech from open population, would not happen in my lifetime. Yeah. Now here we have it, yeah. you know. And, and that has nothing to do with the fact that we have been doing speech recognition research. It's got everything to do with the fact we now have a million times more computing power. Yeah. Without that power, we could not have done it. Yeah. What was it like collaborating with uh, McCarthy? And or, do you remember anything about writing the paper or pr putting the paper together with them as a young graduate student? And yeah, uh, no, the, you were I, already faculty. I, yeah. yeah, I was already faculty member, but you know, McCarthy didn't seem to care. <laughs> okay, and he was happy. You know, he was one of the great things about him is he was very permissive, empowering. And uh, he would say, "Okay, you want to do that? Go, go do it." <laughs> and that was exciting, in a way. But at the same time, uh, if he had kind of taken more time and spent more time on with the students and so on, maybe we might have done a bigger, bigger, better job, because he had great ideas. You know, whenever he would say something, even I remember we were driving back together to Arasadero Road once. And he said, you know, the, the, it is not what the computers do, it's going to be what the applications of computers that will transform the world, right? And he, even, even then, even though he was kind of doing theoretical AI and so on, he was seeing the, appli in the applications. Interesting, interesting. As a, as, a, as a Stanford faculty, as a junior faculty, did you attend, I mentioned it earlier, the, the DARPA PI meetings, and were they happening at Snowbird at that point? Do you remember? No, that they were not happening at Snowbird. Snowbird was a later thing. Later, okay. Uh, I remember attending a, a DARPA meeting at, at Monterey. Uh, this was already in the early 70s, I think. Okay, so you were uh, at Carnegie Mellon by the time. I, I was, uh, Steve Lukasik was the DARPA director and he came, and uh, and I remember one thing he said, even now that's important. He says, I don't care about what you're doing, you know, at the low level of things. Tell me what you can do to improve the efficiency of the President of the United States. And he needs to understand and act on things. If you can kind of create tools that will make him do his job much better. And so, uh, you know, and, and that's where his mind was, you know. And do you think that had an impact on the, uh, on the, 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 Dar the DARPA researchers? Did they actually sort of? Maybe sub, you know, subconsciously, yeah. but I don't think any of us changed anything we were doing as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. And um, when you th look back at Stanford, who were your Close, closest collaborators at Stanford while you were there. Uh, for example, did you work on any projects with, with Ed Feigenbaum? No. no. Basically, I was kind of almost independent. So, so were everybody else, Jerry Feldman and, uh, and, but we were, you know, close friends, we'd have lunch together, and, uh, yeah. and but everybody had their little favorite, you know, touring tarpit, and then we were working on the things, and then and it was a very supportive environment. Yeah. And, uh, okay. And when did your association with ISAT happen? ISAT started in 1989 or oh, something. Oh, much later, okay, Yeah, sorry. and what happened was, I think it was uh, Saul Amaral was the director at the time, after Bob Kahn left, and he asked me to be the first chair of the ISAT. Mm -hmm. I was the chair a couple of years. Okay, I'll come to that later. Yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Um, tell me, uh, so, uh, uh, tell me about your early years at Carnegie Mellon, um, teaching and research. Uh, was it significantly different than Stanford, and what was your focus in both teaching and research? It was, it was not significantly different. Basically, Newell and Simon hired me because they were doing cognitive AI, 
problem solving and so on. They wanted somebody to do the perceptual AI, speech, vision, robotics, which is what I wanted to do. The great thing was, again, the empowering environment, basically. They said, whatever you need, you know, you can have. Yeah. And to give you the best example, we were doing the speech demonstration in 1975 or something, where that was the DARPA Speech Understanding Project. Everybody came, and uh, I needed all the computing power I could get at that time. So we had ordered a second PDP-10 for the use of the whole department. And it just came in, and I went to Newell and I said, I need all of it for the next six months or a year. He said, sure, have it. And you know, that's the kind of thing where, <clears throat> you know, if something made sense, it was very fast decision making. <clears throat> there was a similar story I heard at Bell Labs. <clears throat> Penzias, uh, Anna Penzias, was the director of all of Bell Labs. And Bishnu Atal was doing cell phone capsule uh, coding. Uh, and for that, he needed huge amount of computation to kind of do the, do the simulation of the whole thing. And then he, they found that he was using up more than half of the budget of the entire Bell Labs on the supercomputer. So apparently, Hannah Pence is saying, we can't have him doing that. <laughs> However, we buy equipment for labs. I'm going to buy a whole supercomputer for his lab. <laughs> and that's what he did. You know? So it's kind of interesting, these kinds of uh, very enlightened leadership. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. very neat. What was your first major speech research project? Did you start with hearsay, or was? Yeah, you know, here's, once I got to CMU, we started hearsay and the Harpy systems. You know, okay. um, Harpy system came as a byproduct. Uh, Jim Baker and Janet Baker did the hidden Markov model and uh, Dragon system. And then when they graduated and left, I was kind of saying, obviously there are good ideas there, but it's also brute force search, you have to search the entire space to get an optimal search. Can we do a combination of the two? We created this beam search where we say, we don't have to look at every possible thing, we throw away all the unpromising things, and so you'll get something. And so in, in, you may not get 100% correct, you may get 99% correct. And so that was Harpy? No, that was Harpy. Harpy, and then distinguish it from hearsay. So Here's a, was a blackboard model. The idea was, you know, here are all the different knowledge sources. Each one was an expert in one thing, the, in a lexicon or in a syntax or semantics or something. And each knowledge source, if, if you're playing chess or understanding chess game, the fact you say pawn to king four, knowing the chess board, you can use that knowledge to kind of constrain what was said. It turns out all knowledge have the same, same property. Whereas knowledge about a sound, knowledge about a word, knowledge about you know, structure, whatever, all that they do is reduce the space of alternatives that you have to look at. Okay. And so, that, that idea that you have these different knowledge sources, they don't speak the same language, but somehow you can use them. And then the Blackboard model simply says, everybody, when they discover something, this hypothesize and test paradigm, writes on a Blackboard. While the others may not be able to see, speak their language, they can see the hypothesis. And then they can, based on what they see, they can do, do their thing. This is the same thing as the post-productions we talked about earlier. At each state, everybody looks at what do I, what is there. Given that, what can I do? Yeah. 
and uh, so that kind of um, um, that basically the models of AI, you know, this idea of non-sequential computation, simply say human brain works in this particular fashion. They they react to the state, and then based on that they kind of then they go to the next. Next state. It's not sequential programming like an algorithm. Uh, un understood. Um, did those projects start pretty much immediately after you arrived in Pittsburgh? Yes. Okay. Basically, uh, the way it happened was I came in, already CMU CM had a DARPA grant, so there was no, there was funding. And then in 1971, uh, DARPA said, Let's, we ought to have a big project on speech understanding systems. And there's a report that Newell chaired about speech understanding systems report. And you, they used that as a way of kind of funding half a dozen different places, BBN, Lincoln Labs, and CMU, and SRI, and, and, and so on. And, um, and the task was, we, you know, you have to demonstrate a thousand-word vocabulary system in five years. Thousand-word vocabulary connected speech system. Almost everybody did it, except depending on the model they chose and the amount of kind of sophistication that went into it, some of the systems were extremely slow, like the BBN system, whereas the, both CMU systems because they were also using heuristics and kind of reducing search, and yep. the, uh, were able to get sufficient accuracy, but 100,000 times faster. Right. Right. Yes. And so that was essential to get some faith that these things may ultimately be useful. Yeah. But in reality, the other option is also always good to consider. That's what happened with deep learning. The original backpropagation algorithm was invented by Jeff Hinton when he was at Stanford, yeah. and at CMU. Yeah. He was there from 1980 to 86 or something. Then he went to Toronto. And he was always kind of had this one track mind, right? He said, I need to, uh, I, human beings use neural networks. They demonstrate intelligence. I need to use exactly the same kind of thing to demonstrate intelligence. Yeah. And it's good that he lived long enough to get a computer that's a million times more powerful so his ideas would start to work. But in 1981, 86, when the original backpropagation algorithm, it was kind of disappointing year after year. You know, Of course, you could write papers and publish them and discuss with people, but there was no proof demonstrable proof that neural networks of any kind, uh, deep neural networks, would actually work better. Yeah. When you first started, who were some of the participants, both students and uh, faculty that you remember who were? At, at uh, Carnegie Mellon? Yeah. Main, main two, three people were Newell, Simon, and Perlis. Okay. Perlis was the expert in programming languages, who was also the head of the department. A very fine person, the three of them. And the interesting thing about them is even though each of them was a leader in the field by in their own right, but somehow they subsumed their ego and worked very good, well together. And that was not the case at MIT and Stanford. The, the, so you find this collaborative and, and then accept and find, find compromises and do things rather than going off and saying, this is my idea, this is the way it has to be done. And that was what made Carnegie Mellon what it is, even today, those three people. And in terms of uh, the people who worked with you in, in the early days of speech, right. who, who participated with you? Well, you know, the, you know, Lee Ehrman, Victor Lesser, Hayes Roth, Mark Fox, uh, 
then there are some other people a little did, later. Did Victor Zhu come later? No, Victor Zhu was at, always at MIT. Oh, he was not, I see, yes. But we worked together, I namely, see. we were part of the MIT speech group that was part of the speech understanding project, right? Okay. So we would meet each other three, four times in a year, and, um, and it was good. That and then early graduate students, uh, how early did Kai-Fu Lee come? Kai Fu Li, and, and that was the second batch, you know, maybe they came, he came in 1981 or 82, got his PhD in 87, I think. Or, okay. Then we, he stayed on as an assistant professor at, yeah. at Carnegie Mellon and yeah. went to Apple 90 or 91 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. That's interesting. But um, describe the roots of the, you then were, a, uh, instrumental in the creation of a robotics group. Right. What are the, what's the story of the... <laughs> Basically, you know, we had a president, Dick Seyert, Dick, at the Carnegie Mellon, and uh, he convened a meeting saying, hey, I came from Washington, D.C. There's a lot of concern that Japanese are eating our lunch, and uh, with robotics, this, that, and the other, do we have anything to show for you know, in that area? And um, so I was there, and Noel was there, and uh, Joe Traub was the head of the department and um, was there and so on. We said we are doing robotics, you know, uh, and uh, we, we, uh, various things, uh, vision and speech and so on, but the scale at which we are doing is very small. We're spending maybe a million dollars a year we should be spending 10 to 100 million dollars a year to if to have real impact on the world so he, what he did was um, contacted the head of you know of westinghouse at that point it was still one major corporation and uh, so tom murren who was kind of number 2 or number 3 uh, was put in charge of working out what might be done. And so Tom, after listening to my presentation, gave us $5 million for five years, uh, sight unseen, no proposal, nothing. And we got a similar amount of money from Admiral Bachoko of ONR. Those two sources of funding you know, were the seed. DARPA might have given, but they, you know, that came later. Was yeah. this late 70s then? That, when yeah, did they, it, it was started. And the meetings happened in 77, 78, and we got started the Robotics Institute in 79. And, uh, and I became the head of robotics because I, I, I roughly knew what I wanted to do, but I was myself not competent to do them, right? Yeah. Yeah. What were the first projects or prototypes or right. what, the, what did you the, set out the to? Two, the two big themes then were autonomous systems, the autonomous vehicle projects, and the drones, all of that came out of there. Okay. And uh, the other one is, you know, ma manufacturing automation. So even the, the early on, we built systems you know, where what we call lights out manufacturing, where there was no human in being at all. In retrospect, I'm saying that's probably a bad design. What you need is human machine manufacturing systems, right. where machines are doing all the boring and difficult and you know, dangerous things, and but still, its human being is there. The reason that becomes very important, you know, uh, there was a very good example that came out. I don't know if you remember Taurus, when Ford introduced Taurus, this was mid-80s or something, um, and uh, they built, you know, based on the advice we gave or something, they built fully autonomous system for making fenders. And, uh, and the, the car was selling like gangbusters, and this autonomous system was not designed with human beings anywhere in the loop. So one thing broke down, everything came to a grinding halt. 
and there was no space for a human being to do the job that the machine was doing. And so what they did, they, the manager of the factory do? He said, to hell with it, we're going to only use people and got rid of all of the automation. Interesting, yeah, I so didn't know that story. Because you know, he, he's under pressure, he needs to deliver the, the fenders. Um, from a focus point of view, when you started the robotics group, did you set the speech work down? No. It was going on summer, that's, you know, in the 80s, that's when Kai Fuli did his work. Yeah. We were doing vision, Takeo Kanade came, he was doing that. And in fact, that was part of the robotics group. There was a vision stream, yeah. and we, we, that was the beginning. Now we still have 20, 30, outstanding vision faculty at CMU. Yeah. And then the, there was robotics of two or three different kinds. One was, can you build a system that drives itself? Yeah. And it took us 20 years to demonstrate. The, again, the computers were not fast enough. Red Whitaker and so on. Was he one of the young faculty who came as part of this? Yeah. He was one of the first faculty members. He was also in civil engineering. Mm -hmm. and. And he was not publishing any papers, so they were not going to promote him. I said, it doesn't matter. You know. So we, I hired him in robotics, and then he, he, you know, his career is kind of a... He had a big impact. Big impact, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, um, and so um, you started with a total of $10 million from these two sources, um, but ultimately it grew to being even bigger than that. Oh, much bigger. And right now, it's close to $100 million a year. And uh, more than about a half of that work is applications of robotics and uh, in defense yeah. and yeah. various other things, yeah. Did that participation or the creation of that robotics group lead to your partici uh, participation in the NASA, NASA Machine Intelligence and Robotics Study Group? Where were they no, that was, that was in parallel. That happened, if you look at the date of publication of the, the Carl Sagan report, yeah. it was published in 79. And we were meeting in 76 and 77, 78, because NASA wanted to know what AI, what impact AI might have. And uh, that whole <coughs> report is on the web, and I, it was scanned and it's, you can yeah. see it. And um, if, if you want, I can send it to you also. But. Um, and uh, it had all the, you know, who is who. Minsky was there, Pat Winston was there, and, and people were there. And again, by accident, I ended up being the vice chairman of the thing. Yeah. And uh, we put the whole report together. Just in terms of the debate about the role of humans in space, there's been this philosophical sort of debate over whether you should have machines uh, explore space or whether humans should explore space. Did you guys come down on one side or another? Was that a live part of that debate at that point? Right. So we did not come down on one or the other, but what we said is there should be both kinds of exploration. You can have autonomous systems, Mars rover-like things, but many times, if you're going to colonize space, or if you're going to exploit space, mining of the, you know, rare, you know, minerals or, or in a, you know, uh, in a spa a spa a space colonization, space mining, space, you know, exploitation, there you may need both human, human beings also may have to be in the loop, except because it's what we call 90% self-replicating machines. You, can, you, know, you can, can drop a DNA on the surface of the moon and have it build itself a factory, but the technology for doing that is not there yet. So rather than saying you've got to do everything 100%, we will ship some minimum equipment there and then it can reproduce itself. Okay. That became, there were two projects we started there, mm -hmm. and the, you know, one of them was with Fritz Prince, who is at Stanford now. He used to be head of the department, chaired professor in mechanical engineering. And the basic idea there was 
can you build a lathe which will co make a copy of itself? Yeah. Even with the human you know, help and so on. Yeah. The other one was Paul Wright, who was also a professor of mechanical engineering, who is now at Berkeley, uh, and he's the dean there too. Paul uh, started a project on parts on demand, we call it. It's, if you remember, there was a thing called Moses to build silicon chips. This was a mechanical Moses where anybody can design a part and send it somewhere and it'll make it, that part and send it back to you next morning. And did this, was this the, the father of 3D printing or? It was father, of the, in fact, you know, the first demonstration of 3D printing was done at CMU by Fritz Frenz using the stereolithography stuff, the plastic. Mm -hmm. That was in, but you know, we made actually, we made a 3D model of statues of people like you and me and the president of the you know, CMU, and then we would create a statue out of it. Yeah. This was in 1987 or 88 or something, and uh, that's when stereolithography first came out except it was both time consuming and expensive. What 3D printing has done now is the diversity of materials you can use in the printing is much larger, not just the plastic thing. And the speed, you know, the thing uh, in order to make those 3D statues took us like a whole day or two or three days. Now you can, they can do it in much faster, tenth of the time. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a couple more questions about your early days at CMU. Um, did you, fairly soon after you arrived, begin consulting for Xerox Palo Alto Research Center? Yes. So, so you kept a foot on the West Coast. So yes. Sort of. Tell me about what your what your fun, your role was at, at Park. Yeah. So basically, Xerox Park was kind of founded by friends of mine, right? Basically. And um, so they were all there, and and so I, they also wanted to do speech and other things. So I was a consultant for them. Alan Newell was a consultant. Uh, the two of us would come at different times, and and Alan Perlis was also a consultant. By that time, he was at Yale, and um, my, I was I used to work with George White, who was. George, you know, kind of went on to various things. He's now at Carnegie Mellon in Qatar, teaches entrepreneurship. And, um, but George was doing speech recognition. He, he was doing it at Stanford with me when I was there, and then he continued that. At and Park. at what point did Winograd show up, and did Winograd and you overlap at Park? No, Winograd never came to Park. He went to Stanford. Okay. Terry Winograd went to Stanford as a associate professor a few years after I left, mm. maybe 71 or 72. Don Knuth came the same year I left. Okay. Yeah. So, and Bob Floyd also you know, was at Stanford and at CMU, he came here yeah. about one year before I left. As a consultant, Park, did you have any uh, participation with the Alan Kay's Learning Research Group or was that a separate Yeah, group? yeah. No, I, more of a cheating <laughs> role. Because you know, he, he, Alan and I go back to Stanford and previous days. He was also he was at Stanford, and um, so we were kind of good friends. And and so whenever I I see him, he would kind of drag me and say, "Look at this small talk object." Or I mean, I, I said he was passionate about it. And uh, did did you have a perspective on small talk and object oriented programming? Did that seem like um, you know, intellectually important uh, thread to you? I didn't understand the full power of it until I started using Next. Uh -huh. And so, you know, basically, uh, Steve Jobs internalized the concept and implemented it on Next. And so the, the interesting thing is if you designed in a like a word document on PC, and you would and on the screen it would look at one size, and then you print it, it would be completely different size. 
had no relationship. Whereas on the next, what you see is what you get. You know, you, you, it'll show you exactly what you're likely to see if you print it. It doesn't matter where it is. And, yeah. the, uh, and all the properties carried forward. And so there was only one place you can edit, whether you're editing in a, do a Word document or you're editing in you know, a spreadsheet or you're editing somewhere else. It's the same thing. It would work over and over again. That was very powerful. And was that the first time you met Steve? Was when he was selling the next idea academically? Did, did he come around? And yeah, I, I met Steve before then, be, before he even left Apple the first time, um, because he was interested in speech even then. So George White dragged me along saying, hey, you have to meet Steve, Steve Jobs. I said, okay. <laughs> we went, and he was in a little trailer of somewhere, somewhere. and uh, and he, you know, we we had talk. This was during the Macintosh year, while he was designing yeah. Mac. Or? Yeah, yeah, it was even before Macintosh. Wow. I think seventy. Had he started on Lisa? Seventy six, oh, seventy seven. Yeah, yeah. The, they were they they had he had already come out with uh, uh, Apple II. I remember. Uh, Carl Sagan asking me, I'm looking to buy a, a computer, what should I get? I said, I don't know, but say, you, you think I should get a Apple II or something? I said, sure, why not? You know, if, so basically, at that time, I had not used Apple II, but I knew about it. And, uh, but, uh, and so then he started working on, on the Mac system. And then once he had the Mac, he came to CMU before this was, and he was showing it, you know, to, and one of the, and, uh, he was so excited, you know. So I, my, my daughter was kind of small. He said, let me show you, you know. <laughs> and, and isn't this uh, cute, you know, you can do this and that. And, and so in that sense, he was kind of um, passionate about everything that he was doing. It was fantastic, you know. Yeah. So um, I, let me ask you this: During this whole period, you, you left and you went on to become a faculty. And um, were you ever tempted in that early period to do something entrepreneurial or leave an academic community? Were there? Yeah, yeah I have been involved in entrepreneurial stuff, but I never felt that I'm, you know, built mentally and to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> so. Um, we founded a, a company about the same time Feigenbaum and others founded a company here. What was it called? Called Technology here. Oh, you were part of no, the technology. No, no, no. Technology was founded here. We founded something called Carnegie Group, and that was Mark Fox, J Jaime Carbonell, um, McDermott, and me. And um, it it did well, and um, and and then. It went public, and then you know it went up and down, and so on. So I we rode the whole thing through. The but it never pulled you out of academia. No, I I, I never wanted to leave uh, academia, and I said I'm happy to be a consultant. I'm happy to be an advisor, but I don't want to be full time running a company. Yeah. I, you, you know, you were at Stanford at the very beginning. You went to. Carnegie Mellon, and I've always been struck about the two different cultures of the different institutions. I mean, Stanford has evolved to the point where it sometimes feels like people come simply to make the toe touch on the way to uh, on their way to start their company. CMU seems to have an academic culture that persists. Did, does, do it, you have it, that sense? No, of it's, not, it's a matter of degree. If you look at them after you peel away the academic part. Every faculty member there also is involved in some com startup company, even now. And I don't know about all of them, but I keep discovering so and so is in it. And um, the best example at CMU is Louis Wanan, uh, who has done Duolingo, and before that he was doing other things. And right? Capture. Capture well. and yeah. so on. Yeah. Recapture yeah. and uh, yeah. so on. Um, and then Uber more recently has had this big impact on the. Yeah. yeah. But that and, was. Uh, very, uh, tell me about your um, st the 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 students that you had who had a significant impact. The ones that I know of are James and Janet Baker, Kaifu Lee, 
Zhudong Huang and Harry Shung. Right. Uh, I, I, let's see, the, the Bakers went to IBM ultimately, I guess. No, not no. ultimately. The first, they went to IBM and then they went to Exxon or That's something right. and then started their own company. Okay. And they built it up and they sold it for $650 million to Leonard and Hauschby, which ended up having the Enron problem. Yes. They and lost it ended the, up as part of Nuance, ultimately, didn't it? I think uh, they got yeah, acquired by they, Nuance, and ultimately. And so what happened was uh, they lost all the, um, a large part of their money. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it went to, you know, the, the, they took G Goldman Sachs to court and the and court said, Goldman Sachs told, you know, you can do this or that. You did whatever you did. They, you can't hold them. That way, in that sense, uh, in the people in the, in the auditors and the advisors in mergers and acquisitions, they cover their bets, right? <laughs> so that they're not responsible. Yeah, good. Um, I'm thinking about the influence of your graduate students. Um, the Bakers, of course, had this big influence on the development of speech, as did Kai Fu. And then Huang and Shum at Microsoft, uh, you, you know, their research and development impact on computing was significant. Are there other students that come to mind that? Yeah. The current head of Microsoft research in China, his name is Han, Shaolin Han, and um, he was also there about the time. And um, if you look at, say, Victor Lesser and Lierman, they were also earlier students, but their impact is more academic than than the other ones. So <clears throat> the other person who was part of the time my student and then went to work with uh, Bob Sproul is James Gosling. You know. And he gives me credit for the invention of the interpreter of the Java. <laughs> he says, I invented it when I was working with Raj or something like that. Was he working on speech with you or what did he do? He was working on systems and basically, <clears throat> you have to understand, in order to work on speech and vision and robotics, you also need to dabble in hardware. In particular, microprogrammed hardware. Uh, signal processing and various other things. And uh, so we built, in fact, a vision computer. And we, you know, and uh, we were working with these workstations that were microprogrammable. And um, so uh, about the same time Sun Workstation and... Was this Perk or Perk, was it? Perk was Workstation Perk. came about. All of them... Uh, had the opportunity, op option, to either use Unix or something else. And the, the, the mi main mistake that happened was Perk started with Perk Pascal, uh, Pascal P code, uh, whereas everybody else just bit their bullet and licensed Unix. Yeah. And um, ultimately, that's the right thing to have done. And I wanted to ask also, did CMU play a role in the development of SPICE? Or did that come from Berkeley? I, I saw no, SPICE as a personal computer project? No, you're not, uh, you're not talking about SPICE, that circuit design? Yeah, I was thinking, but was there? There are multiple SPICEs. Okay, yeah. so there, there's SPICE as the, uh, the, the, the uh, circuit design tool. Yeah, that was only done at Berkeley. Berkeley, but then there was something called SPICE that led to Mach. Yeah. Now that, that is, was what I was asking. That about. is the campus-wide networking project. Something computer environment, you know, individual uh, I'll find out what it is from uh, one person that has been there, <coughs> still there, is Scott Fallman, you know, who is involved in that whole ne you know, campus networking project. Okay. And, and um, out of that came Rashid's work on Mach. Yeah. Okay. And with, was Rashid, um, did he study with you at all? Or no. 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 I rec recruited him. Oh, was he in faculty? Yeah, into the faculty. Okay. And um, gave him 
all my initial funding to do the distributed networking because I had a project from Bob Khan on distributed sensor networks. I said, before I can do my research, you have to build a, a distributed system, and that's how Mach came about. And what was the relationship between the distributed uh, networking work and the uh, creation of the network file system uh, standard? Yeah. So the, the, the uh, distributed networking, and a Mach is just an operating system. But the Andrew uh, file system okay. is part of a campus-wide networking project. The problem Jim Morris faced, who was the head of the, the whole IBM campus networking project, where IBM funded us to demonstrate a campus-wide networking, was <coughs> we were going to have fiber to every office. This was in 1981. And we used to call it the greening of CMU with computer science. And um, <clears throat> and in order to make that whole thing work, you had to build a campus-wide network. And you had to have workstations, personalized workstations throughout the campus. And they had to be usable in various ways. The operating system could be Mark, it could be you know Unix, whatever they they didn't make. And one thing that became clear: students will go from building to building. These workstations were not yet portable like laptops, so they have to go sit somewhere and use them. And when they sit somewhere, magically that system must become their personal computer. That means within a matter of a second or so, it should download the entire environment, all their files and all their you know, stuff they're working on, everything must be there. And the minute they log out, it all backs, goes back into the thing. That's, that, has the, that is the origins of the cloud computing. Yeah, yeah that's remarkable. Um, so I saw in 1997 a picture of you with um, a, a group that I believe won the uh, World Championship Computer Chess right. Award. Right. What was your participation? Basically, we set up a prize called Fredkin Prize. Ed Fredkin, at my suggestion, gave $100,000 or something, and we put it up in an endowment at CMU. And then the basic idea was the first time a computer beat the world champion, which according to Simon was supposed to happen in end of 1960, it happened in the end of 1990, 1997. Kasparov was beat by Deep Blue. And so we said, okay, now we should give this prize. But it turns out chess Championship did not happen overnight. It was built on top of a lot of other people's work. You know, it was like, I think, this saying of uh, Newton, saying if I've invented these things, because it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of other giants. And so similarly, what happened there was, there was Greenblatt chess program at MIT, early one. There were two or three programs at CMU. The tech, Gilogli did it. Uh, then there was a high, high tech that Hans Berliner did. And then there was a deep thought that was the same team that did the deep blue at IBM. And uh, all of them kind of demonstrated higher and higher levels of competence. There were two other people that made important contributions. Ken Thompson at Bell Labs built their, his own Bell system, BLLE. -L -L -E. And there were people at Northwestern that did the uh, work. So we said, we really ought to honor all of them, not just the people that did the. So we gave the million, uh, $100,000 prize to the three people. That was uh, C.B. Su, Thomas Anantaraman, and uh, Murray Campbell, and one, and one other person. Um, and they got the, the Fredkin Prize. But then we also gave everybody else a, a, 
Newell Medal of Research Excellence and some, I don't know whether there was any financial thing also, all the others, we invited all of them, paid their expenses. It was done at the AAAI conference in 1997. I think that at that time, that, that year it was in either Boston or Rhode Island or something. And that was, uh, I think that's, the, you know, if you look at almost any advance, major advance in, in any of our fields, it is kind of built on a lots of earlier work. We need to figure out a way of not losing all of that you know, connection. Yeah. And that was the first time we did it. The second time we did it was, if you remember, you came to SAIL reunion. Uh, you know, uh, fortunately, McCarthy was still alive at that time. And we, uh, we gave medals, McCarthy Medal of Research Excellence to about 10 people, each of whom like Larry Tesler and you know various other people, they did major things that were just below the level of kind of uh, becoming big industries. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the I, I looked in Google Scholar, and your most cited paper is a paper titled "Spoken Language Processing: A Guide to Theory, Algorithm, and System Development." Um, can you tell me much about that that paper? Was it a, a broad overview of the field? Is that why it's it's so so often cited? Probably, uh, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so besides um, Harpy and Hearsay, there was also Sphinx. Right. Did, was Sphinx a follow-on project, or in terms yeah. of your notion of built yeah. on top of the? They're all follow-on in the sense they built on what worked and what did not work but there was no software migration. Right. There may have been some local signal processing or something, yeah. but in a, uh, the Sphinx was built. While we were doing Sphinx, there was all, we were also doing another system. I forget the name of it. Um, we had Sphinx and, um, and the idea was, again, it's kind of, the same kind of a blackboard model type thing where at that point we all believed knowledge-based systems capturing and encoding all the knowledge is the way to build AI systems. Yeah. And it turns out when it comes to speech and vision and robotics we do things in the brain which is not written down in any textbook. We don't understand how we recognize speech. So we imagine and we make up models of it and linguists make up their own models. And, uh, they, they, and if you talk to any linguists or phoneticians, they will say they can transcribe any language. And I, I did an experiment of that in, in the in mid 70s. I, brought five distinguished phonet phoneticians, Gunnar Font and Ilse Lahist and so on, uh, and gave them a set of sentences from many different languages, Swahili, Marathi, all kinds of things, and said, I know what they're supposed to be, but let us see if you can listen to you can listen to it as many times as you want. Write down a phonetic transcription of what they said. Amazingly, the only they, they only agreed with each other about sixty six percent of the time. <laughs> and and so that kind of told me that the human ear, the if somebody says I can transcribe a completely new language. He's transcribing what he thinks he heard, but that may not be the same as what is being spoken. Yeah. It may not be the same as what somebody else would hear. And, uh, and this is especially true if, if you or I are listening to tonal languages like Chinese, we won't hear those distinctions. Yeah. When you were doing that, work at that point, were you aware of Chomsky's work in linguistics and what was your, yeah. were you? I was very aware of it. At that time, I didn't have 
a strong opinion, but I do have now. I can tell you what, what it is. is. Yeah, what have you come to Basically, opinion? Chomsky's main thesis is human beings are born with innate knowledge of language. It is built into them, and built into the DNA. I have a slightly different hypothesis, which is they do demonstrate understanding of language at the month, 10 months old and 15, 12 months old. So the question is, where did they get it? And if you imagine a child developing in the womb, the hearing apparatus is already formed at the end of three months or four months. So if you are hearing what your mother is speaking, and if you're hearing what your mother is hearing, or whoever it is, every day in and day out for 16 months, you would acquire some amount of sound clustering, sound language and understanding of phrases and maybe you know, common things that you might have seen. That would appear to be linguistic or language, <clears throat> but it is not DNA built in, it's not in the DNA, it is learned behavior. And I believe the same is true with respect to vision. Unlike speech, where you are learning speech from the, when you're three months of the boom, <coughs> until you're born and you open your eyes, you don't have any ability to see. But after six months, of seeing your mother's face many times, you're able to recognize that particular impression and smile. And uh, there's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, Michael Tarr, who wrote a, you know, he's a, you know, brain science scientist, neuro neuron scientist, head of the Department of Psychology. His thesis is there is a computer in your brain one micro, you know, one millimeter cube or something, million neurons, which has nothing, does nothing other than recognizing your mother's face. There are about 10,000 such in the brain. And that's what, you know, you, the, it's, uh, your brain is a, a collection of a million specialized computers. And when Daniel Kahneman says fast thinking and slow thinking, all the fast thinking happens because it's instantaneous recognition. Slow thinking is when you have to reason and discover something rather than instantaneous recognition. So that sort of <coughs> um, theoretical insight that you have, how does that shape your view of machine learning and uh, the, the way, a path, chart a path forward in terms of design of those systems? Right. So the, in, in machine learning also, my view is we can think about building one humongous deep learning network which will recognize everything under the sun. It may be doable, but it'll be extremely expensive and time consuming. What we should be doing is building a large number of highly specialized recognizers. So if you take your language and my language, if, if I told you, give me a break, you'll recognize it. And that's because that's the phrase. And so what I'm saying is we should build a million recognizers of con contiguous phrases of all the way from sounds to the thing. And then if you suddenly hear a brand new phrase that you never heard before, Brzezinski, you don't know that it's a word, you don't know whether it's the name of a city or a name of a person or name of anything, but you can at least write down what you heard as a spelling. And that spelling won't be perfect, but it'll be there, and it'll be close enough. And I believe that, that you know, Minsky had the right idea when he in the book called Society of Minds, his idea was that there's not one single intelligence which is doing all the things, which is the basic thesis of Nolan Simon. You know, 
Um, I believe it's really a million of those things, but they can't be by themselves. They have to interact with each other in the following sense. You know, if I'm going to spend some money to buy something on Amazon, Amazon there has to be a link to say, is that money there in my bank account? If not, what do I do? So that kind of, if, even if you have a buying agent and a banking agent in your brain, they have to somehow interact under some conditions. Yeah. So this conditioning of each other, prior conditioning of agents, turns out to be very important. Um, were the projects like uh, Hearsay and Harpy and Sphinx, the projects that were the, the basis for the Turing Award? Or right. Were there others that are important to mention? No, I think those were the ones. Basically, uh, the Turing Award came in 94. It's a collection of work that was done until that point, cumulative collection, which demonstrated large vocabulary connected speech recognition is possible. Yeah. And what it did not demonstrate, which we now know, is unlimited vocabulary, unrestricted language, open population, unrehearsed speech, unrehearsed spontaneous speech from open population was not even on our horizon at that time. And that's what is kind of amazing to me, you know, today, sitting and saying, my gosh, we made huge progress. And, and not because we, did, we invented some new speech algorithms. It's the same algorithms we did in 30, 40 years ago. It is because now we have a million times more computing power, which makes it possible for us to train from huge amounts of data. Do you know that flippant comment made by an IBM executive a number of years ago about that every time he fired a linguist, his his uh, his speech <laughs> processing <laughs> better. Got, got better? <laughs> it was flippant, but it sort of speaks to the fact right. that the machines were, yeah. the ideas were there, but we didn't have the computing power to. Right, exactly. Now, the, the way to think about it is if you hire a linguist and the, and the, and then he says, this, this is the way I think the, you know, my brain is recognizing speech. Maybe machines do not recognize it that way. We don't have a knowledge or a bo textbook on how humans recognize speech, unlike chemistry or physics or something. Um, what are your memories of the time you spent um, with the group that Jean-Jacques Servan Schreiber created, uh, Le, Le Center Mondial in, right. in Paris and its impact. Yeah, again, you know, there's an example where, you know, old friendships come back, you know. So I was sitting in my office, you know, in the 80s, early 80s, and Alan Kay walks into my office saying, Raj, you know, I've been working with Jean-Jacques Servan Schreiber. I think you're exactly the right person to come and get involved with it. I said, what was it? You know, so we talked, you know, had lunch together. And I said, look, I'm right in the middle. I was just agree, you know, heading the Robotics Institute. We just started last year. I can't take off from here. But I, I am very interested in how technology can be used to help society, in particular poor and you know, illiterate and, uh, and people. And uh, so I agreed to become the chief scientist for that center. And uh, Nicholas Negroponte came, and he was the secretary general, the, you know, kind of chief executive. And uh, then uh, John Jacques Sarban Schreiber was the chairman. And, it, you know, it's a great experience in international science projects, actually. It turns out when you have two or three, you know, big personalities, There'll be clashes. That's what happened between uh, Negroponte was great, and he was doing what he thought, and Sarvan Schreiber thought it should be something else. So finally, and, and, and Nicholas 
said, I don't need this, and went back, you know. And the uh, same happened with Alan Kay. Alan didn't have any conflict. Teru Vinograd and Alan Kay and a number of others were there. None of them could deal with the French bureaucracy. And I didn't have that problem. Number one, I was only not being paid at all. I said, I don't want any pay. Uh, everybody else was. And secondly, I was commuting back and forth. And so I was happy to be able to be there and help kind of do the projects that they were doing. So ultimately in 84, before, I think Mitterrand left in 86 or something, in 84, when uh, Mitterrand came to USA, he went to different places. Uh, who was the mayor of Atlanta? Young something? Oh, yeah, Andrew Young. And he, gave, he, he was given a, a Le Jean Donard medal. There were two or three. I was one of them. <laughs> okay. I think it was mainly because of my contributions to, uh, to uh, the thing. There was a generation of young students who went there. I, I know some of them, people like Mike Hawley and Mark Seiden, who worked there as young right. kids, but it, it influenced them. So oh, yeah. It, it a lot of young people came. For them, it was kind of like being in a candy store. There were all these personal computers. They could come and use any of them but with no restrictions. Yeah. Uh, Negra Pandey was trying to create a world, what it could be like when everyone had unlimited access. And in addition to uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Sarban Schreiber, there was another famous personality. I don't know if you know the name Sam Pizar. Sam Pizar uh, was a Holocaust survivor <coughs> and had a very you know, colorful uh, history. Uh, it, it's very interesting to read his book of Blood and Hope. <clears throat> how he survived from the, the concentration camp and ended up in Australia. And then he became advisor to John Kennedy and then, then, then migrated to France and became a lawyer there. And he, he has all kinds of interesting stories about how the, they avoided paying New York State taxes for Elizabeth Taylor's big diamond and <clears throat> apparently, it was the the seller took the diamond on a plane, and uh, the buyer was on the plane also, somewhere on the mid Atlantic, when there was <laughs> no country, they exchanged the check and thing, and uh, so these are the kinds of little anecdotes. Yeah. <laughs> that have nothing to do with. That's great. <clears throat> so. Um, what was your role in the creation of the of the triple AI? The um, yeah. Uh, when did so, it yeah, happen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Triple AI was created also around seventy eight, seventy nine. The first conference was held at Stanford in seventy nine uh, or eighty. Uh, the, the, uh, because the reason it happened was, I was looking at various um, other activities in a. SIGGRAPH was a good example. It's a big, a very interesting conference. You go to it. And um, there was a president of ACM at that point who was cantankerous. I forget now who it was. So it turned out um, that Feigenbaum wanted to have a, a conference in Hawaii. And ACM said, the president said, no, we're not going to sponsor It's a boondoggle. We're not going to sponsor it. They had the conference anyway, without the sponsorship. So at, the, at, at some point, there was a feeling AI is getting bigger and bigger. Already the technology and all the other AI companies were there and you know, uh, were coming up. And so uh, I was the chairman of Ichkai the previous year. So people came and said, we should have our own Con annual conference in USA because there's so much activity. So I kind of took it upon myself to create the whole thing. And uh, all of that is reported in 25th anniversary issue of AAAI. And, um, 
And it worked beautifully. You know, we had a nice conference. We, you know, I got Noel to become the first president and Feigenbaum to become the second president, set up a council and advisory committees, program committees, how it would run the conferences and so on. And we made a lot of money because we were having exhibits at the same time. And uh, they, they made a lot of money at that time. AI was right at the top again, you know. And so the, the thing I, in retrospect, 30 years later, I regret is, at that time, I wanted it to be free for the students. And I wanted to limit the registration fees to be $200 or so. Now the registration fee is like $1,000, and students have to pay half the price or something. And the reason was, even though I said it and told everybody, the people that were there at the time were no longer in charge. New people come, yes. new things happen. That's why I have a huge respect for the Constitution of the United States. You have to write down everything, every detail, and say, this is the way it has to be. And then you have to make every president swear that they will follow the Constitution of the AAAI. We never built a Constitution. So this is something I think uh, yeah. anyone that builds a new organization has to worry about. The, f the field that, um, that you were a pioneer in uh, had two periods. Well, one was just in England, but there were two periods that were referred to as AI winters. One in the late 70s when British funding was cut back and then in, in the in the 1980s in America, did did that affect you at all um, as an academic? Or? It did. And, uh, the the good thing was, even DARPA, even when they cut cut off the funding for speech and image understanding in the in the first in the early 80s, they gave us some money, saying this is a kind of a center of excellence money, you can use some of it for speech if you want to keep doing it. So we could continue to do all those things, including autonomous vehicles work and so on, for many years. And, and then slowly the money came back. DARPA you know, has been the main source of innovation in computer science, you know, everything you know, that came out. Yeah. Um, in, your, in terms of your uh you, you, sort of your administrative responsibilities at CMU. You created the Robotics Institute. You were the Dean of Computer Science? Yes. Was there a, a, an additional role that you had after beyond that? No. No, okay. So. Uh, I, I kind of helped out that we started a West Coast campus and Institute for Software Research. I kind of helped out and uh, then Jim Morris took over the the West Coast campus and Bill Shirley took over the Institute for Software Research. And then uh, back to the point about the, the, the impact of the uh, AI winter, um, it came sort of after this period that was uh, influenced by the administration funding of something called the Strategic Computing Initiative. Right. Did, did, did that have a big impact on, uh, on Carnegie Mellon and, and your own, own work, or was it separate? No. The, the good thing about CMU is it's so big and so diverse. We have seven departments. They have a department of computer science, robotics. We started the Early Language Technology Institute. Uh, that was the first, the LICOS, the first search engine was built out of there. And um, we have machine learning department, Department of Computational Biology, Human Computer Interaction Institute. So there are about seven different departments. And uh, so the activity was, is, was and is sufficiently diverse, more than half of it is in AI. Uh, you know, although people may not think natural language processing, a language technology institute is AI, it's right in the center of AI. Did any of the SCI money end up helping speech, or, or was it more focused on, on more general AI? Yeah, strategic computing was more general, basically, you know, but the, it, it uh, overall, you know, we, you know, we we had reasonable funding. Yeah, I'm I'm interested too on in in some of your 
more recent, relatively recent work uh, about the impact of computing on society. A at some point, you were involved, or did you start the Million Book Digital Library Project? Right. So basically, and, uh, after I stopped being the dean, I said I can publish some more papers on speech or vision or whatever. And there are lots of other good people doing work, and they'll publish the papers. It's not important that I publish them. So I decided to see if I can work on things that would have major impact on society as a whole. And um, I kind of, I'll give you my today's distilled version of it. I now believe, you know, AI can be used to create a humane society. You know, of, you know, and that means whether you believe in human rights the, of the United Nations, or you believe in strategic and uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, or even basic needs, like in everywhere you take everywhere in the world, there are some disasters. There's water scarcity, food scarcity, energy scarcity, health and education, housing, all kinds of things that are essential for everyone. And I am saying if I can instrument everybody with a smartphone so that I can find out where they are, time and location, and then I can also find out anything else they do with the computer. I can predict exactly what they're doing and where they are, what's happening to them. And then if I can look at a community of people, all of whom have having difficulty because of water scarcity and they're going and forming a big long queue and waiting there for an hour, I can from that predict that there's a water scarcity problem. Uh, same is true for hunger. Same is true for, you know, what, you know, almost everything that you do, I, you know, I can predict what's happening, including slavery. Yeah, at this point in the world, there are 25 million people that are in some kind of a slavery, you know, a lot of them are in bondage and some of them are sex trafficking and so on. And in each of these cases, it can be done. The big elephant is privacy. If I can monitor everything everybody is doing, then I know. So the question is, how do we preserve privacy? I believe the existing anonymization technology is not good enough. But it's, you know, it can be made better so that I can theoretically guarantee that the likelihood that your data can be de-anonymized is one in a billion, arbitrarily small. That in conjunction with opt-in process, that is, like I'm sure you use Waze or something like that. Waze works because it's opt-in. I say, I want you to tell me there's traffic jams. In return, I'll let you tr monitor my travel, mm -hmm. where I'm going and where I'm stopping and all of that. And you, based on that, you infer where the jams are and then reroute me. Yeah. So that's an opt-in process. So if I were to give, there are ha more than 800, I don't know, more than three billion people, maybe five billion, that don't have smartphones in the world. Question is, how do, how, can, how do you get them smartphones? Many of them maybe can afford it, but two billion people cannot ever pay for it. I believe we, the government should give them the phones, and uh, the stakeholders can pay for it because it'll increase the, there's a professor called Eric Brewer at Berkeley, you might know him, he says, if you create this information infrastructure, it will raise the economic activity of everybody. 
And once you have the improved economic architecture, then you build, can build all the rest of the infrastructure, yeah. electric grid and so on. When did the Million Book Project happen? And or, was it your idea? Or yeah. It, so it, it's, again, it, all of these have a long history. It was McCarthy's idea. McCarthy's idea was, hey, everybody's writing the thesis on the computer anyway in the 1973-74. Why don't we simply put all those theses on the web. That was his idea. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the founder of Adobe. Oh, um, um, John. Um, yeah, John Warnock, Warnock and. and Geschke. Chuck, Chuck Geschke. Geschke. Chuck Geschke is one of our students, CMU. He did his first thesis on the XGP printer that we built using um, equipment that Xerox Park gave us. That was in 73 or something. And uh, all of those, be, you know, so in, when I was the chief scientist for Santa Mondial, I said, let's get all these books online. And, uh, and I invited John McCarthy to come, and we went to uh, Provence to set up a center there for digitizing all the French books. And anyway, <laughs> all of those things were never f fully happened. So it, this, this idea has been kind of ticking around in, in our heads. So in 1995, we had a conference in, at CMU on uh, electronic libraries. And I, I invented, invited Bob Kahn and, and Vince Cerf, among others, to that. And I think Wint came up with the idea, let's not call it electronic libraries, let's call them digital libraries. And that's what I remember of the first use of the word digital libraries. And that, that we've been doing it. There's a video uh, that Mike Seamus did in 1997 of a prototype digital library system we had. The idea was even then, it was not just the books. It is the movies, and it's the music, and it is the paintings, and uh, newspapers. Everything should be online. Yeah. And then another project um, that you were involved in was called Fiber Af Africa. Yeah. Oh. We had a, a funding from World, uh, World Bank, Wolfenstein and Wolfowitz, you know, basically Wolfenstein, uh, where we did a, dem you know, a feasibility study for them saying you can connect every country and every major city of Africa for a billion dollars. And, uh, and, the, and the, the reason is the following, namely, in the United States, if you want to dig in and put fiber, it costs $100,000 a mile. In Manhattan, it's like a million dollars a mile. But in Africa, digging and putting silicon fiber, which nobody wants to steal anyway, is only like $5,000 per mile. And another $5,000 for all the equipment and lighting it up and so on. So $10,000 a mile is what we came up with. And we kind of counted uh, connecting all the, we built a whole uh, thing. and. Um, And the total number of miles to connect all the major cities in the thing was like 20,000 or 25,000 miles. So you multiply those two numbers and then you get a billion dollars. And we said, for a billion dollars you can connect every, every country and provide uh, high bandwidth connectivity. And then there were all kinds of things we were not aware of. For example, if apparently in Ethiopia, there is no electricity, so there's a prerequisite here. We assume there's electricity. In many other countries, there's no electric grid. And secondly, there's no cities. People are all over the place, spread out. So solve, I mean, you, you can solve those problems, but the basic idea is you can connect everybody, and then using WiMAX towers, you can essentially connect all the smaller towns. And the cost is reasonably small. 
and then we extended it to the global grid. If you had three horizontal, you know, three east-west fibers, three or four, and uh, seven north-south fibers, you can have a global grid that'll cost like $20 billion, and it would be completely redundant. Even if somebody comes and cuts the one or two fibers, you can still be connected. And uh, it's only $20 billion compared to the world you know, uh, product. I think we, the current world product is like 80 trillion or something, or 100 trillion. Okay. It seems like a trillion. Even if you were to do the last mile, then it increases by a factor by 10. So it's 200 billion. The question is, I, I went to, you know, in my optimism, I went to people at Microsoft and Google and everybody. I said, I said, look, you should be doing this. Forget about the balloons and all the rest of it. <laughs> so. Roughly, when did the Fiber Af Africa work that you participated in, when did you begin participating? That, that was done in the early 20s, in you know, the early, in you know, a late. Uh, I was the chairman of PTAC. Uh, President's Information Technology Advisory Council. As part of that, and the next generation internet study we did, it was clear to me that fiber, a gigabit to every home, is not only feasible, and it can be done economically. Yeah. And Fios, you know, Verizon is doing it. In, in, but in general, that could have been done long ago, especially if the government decided they wanted it. That's what my our recommendation was. Did you get to, to know either Vice President Gore or President Clinton during your period as? Yeah, I, I met them. I don't know what I would call it getting to know. Okay. Usually, yeah. Yeah. they're polite and friendly. And yeah. uh, okay. I was at Davos, and Clinton was there. And then I was invited to a reception he hosted. And, yeah. and you know, he kind of, <laughs> it's very good. But you didn't get a deep, you know, it was so controversial about uh, Gore's role in the creation of the internet. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure it should be controversial. He did not create the internet, but without him, we would not have the World Wide Web. Yeah. 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 So basically, the government had to get involved at some point and say, "This is an important technology. We're going to do it." Until and it needed him to do that. And uh, until that point, it did not. Was there also a certain point where you became involved in uh, helping uh, uh, higher education in India? Did you right. sort of return to, to, to your roots in some way at a certain point? When was yeah, it? Yeah, basically, as part of this technology and service of society, right, which is what I've been doing in the last 10, 15 years after I stopped being the dean. I've been constantly exploring in what ways can technology help, right? And so, like I said, if I had connectivity to every person, I can actually improve the human rights and help predict and, and correct, you know. And various subparts of it, education, healthcare, can be done even better, you know, earlier. And so, one of the things that I offered to do was to kind of set up a rural university. And the basic reason that came to be is, I come from a village, right? And most of the other kids that went to the school with me are still there in the village. And uh, I escaped, and uh, it so happened I was having lunch with the head of the state of Andhra Pradesh. And I said, you are also from a village. <laughs> from a village. Look, we are black, black sheep. There are probably at least 10 times as many people who are equally brilliant in each village. I wonder if there's something we can do. And he said, whatever you suggest, let's do it, you know. And so this, this particular university, Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies, we admit like half a percent of the top students from the 10th class into a six-year program. Everything is free. The food is free. The accommodation is free. The tuition is free. The clothing is free. The shoes are free. And uh, <clears throat> because they're the top students, you know, my assumption was we can admit you know, thousands of them and uh, give each of them a laptop and they would learn by themselves. 
And that's where I was wrong, actually. It turns out most people, you know, from villages and so on, their basic needs are not yet met. So, for example, if you look at the United Nations Declaration of United Nations, Eleanor Roosevelt and all the other people that created it came from rich countries and rich families. They had no idea that there may be people with no water, no education, no health. They're not there in the Universal Declaration. <laughs> the right to water is not there. Right to clean air is not there. Yeah. Because for them, it is a given. So what, I'm, you know, what happens is when you kind of take these, these people, and I say to them, I'll give you a laptop. You can listen to any lecture you want. All you have to do is study and then you know, you graduate and so on. And they're coming from poor families. They've never had any, any money. They have never had any shoes. They have clothes. And so everything becomes a problem. And uh, so well, we were discovering we have 58% women students. And these are all 15-year-old, 17-year-old coming in. They have all kinds of needs which none of us could anticipate and, and provide for. So you're continuing to redesign the university? Yeah, continue <laughs> constantly. How big is it at this point? Is it? It's, it's 18,000 students. And you're, do you have a formal role in it? I am the chairman of the board. Okay. They call them chancellor. Yeah. Uh, so I don't take any money or anything else. I, I go there twice a year. Yeah. What year was it created? It was created 2008. Okay. And um, I think it, you know, it, it's doing a useful service. Yeah. There are many kids that would never have gone to college that are going to college and they're getting degrees and so on. But where I'm kind of disappointed in is, I thought these are all the top students. They'll be ex excited to learn, motivated to kind of learn everything they can. Yeah. Now, That's they just <laughs> come, they have a different set of. Yeah. Uh, you sent me, you shared with me a, 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 a talk that you gave recently, and where you, you talked at the end about sort of roads not taken. And I right. think we've talked about most of them. We talked about the possibility of becoming a pilot. Um, working for IBM, um, becoming a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. We might not have talked about that and, and possibly going to UC Berkeley. All right. those would have led to very different Very different. In your life. See, basically, if you must remember, when 1966, when I graduated, Intel was not yet being formed. It was formed in 68. I knew, you know, Gordon Moore, I met them, you know, sort of lunch or something. I could have joined them, maybe, but it never occurred to me to even think about it. There were other people that were starting startups at that time. There was one guy starting some optics stuff. And, and, um, and Syntex was formed at that time. I don't know, you know the, the, the Carl Gerasi and others were doing these birth control pills. Yeah. All of them needed computer science, right? Computing. Yeah. You know, but it never occurred to do any of those. And uh, so, the, you know, but you could have chased, you know, yeah, the, the, those are the kinds of roads not taken, as, the, as uh, Robert Frost says, right? I think we've, we've touched on many of the high points. I was wondering at this point if there are other interesting things that you've been involved in that I haven't raised that um, were important in the course of your life. Have we, have we, uh, I, I think uh, we have done most of them. Okay. They're always, you know, when you, the, the good thing about, you know, my life is I have been in this birth of computing from the beginning, 1959, which is not quite the birth, but most of the, you know, exciting things started happening after, around that time, 50, after mid 50s. Yeah. Um, and I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to kind of be exposed to all these things for 65 years, is it? Yeah. No, 60 years, something 60 like years. that. And um, 
very feel very lucky. You know. Let me close uh, by asking you, since you were very close to the roots of the field of AI, and you've watched this through this arc of history, now in this, this field there's there are two debates, well, there are many debates, but the two that I wanted to ask you about. One is, in terms of rate of progress, whether you think what is now described as artificial general intelligence will be possible. I won't ask you to pick a date, but do you think we'll be able to reach that period where the machines will be able to do the vast majority of human capabilities? Yeah. I, I think if you agree on with the rule of 80-20, yes, as well, and what that says is, the general intelligence machine must exhibit is to know what, what it does not know. If it is not sure, it should come back and say, I don't understand. Why don't you do it or tell me what to do and I'll learn from you. And uh, so a lot of the issues of common sense reasoning, which is the biggest area of AI where people will give you examples saying you can't tell the difference. If you believe in the million computer theory, to me each one of them is a special piece of knowledge that's learned as an exception. And it's there. And whenever you need it, it's there. It's not something you reason. <clears throat> and that will only happen if we build this man-machine systems or human-machine systems, where every time there's a problem, somebody is giving the answer. And then ultimately, the, the computers will have much better answers than any one human being, because they have the collective intelligence. That assumes that we can solve the privacy problem. Well, um in Silicon Valley, it, it, there is a fashionable perspective that's in some, some schools referred to as the singularity, this notion of an intelligence explosion. Um, and in some cases, there's, there's a debate about whether we're evolving into a, a, another kind of, uh, another species. Do you have a philosophical uh, sense of yeah. whether, whether that's possible? I, I believe we are, we will evolve into a species, new species, but it's not a species that you and I will be able to not recognize. Basically, a small group of us, maybe people in the Silicon Valley or maybe in the United States or some small group of us will have superhuman capabilities. That means we'll be able to do things that nobody else in the world can do because we have created tools to, uh, to do that. There's this movie called Gods Must Be Crazy. Have you heard the, the top yeah. Yeah. Coke bottle? Yeah. Same thing, namely, <coughs> Arthur Clarke used to say that truly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's what it'll look like. That is, even before you open your mouth, I can tell you what you're thinking and what you're going to do and how, how to do it. And in that sense, it is not going to be a completely silicon-based robot that's taking over from us. It is the evolution of some of the human beings so that we, are, we may look the same, but we are, have superhuman capabilities. <clears throat> so in that sense, <clears throat> We are probably, we can say the Homo sapiens are different than Neanderthals. We had better capabilities and they, they survived. And so now the question is, are these superhuman capability people, rather than robots, are they going to kill everybody else? I don't believe so. That may, maybe let's end on that because, um, you know, uh, over the last two years, uh, people like Hawking and Gates and Musk and Russell at Berkeley have all raised these warnings about a, a, a machine intelligence that might be hostile to humanity. It sounds like you don't feel that that's true. 
They said, it could be true in the following sense. Am I hostile to chimpanzees? Most of the time I leave them alone. But if they come and bother me, I might swat them, right? Occasionally, somebody might go hunting for pleasure of hunting a giraffe or something. But most of the time, most of the people will be left alone and they'll coexist. Now the question is, <clears throat> the much better threat that is lost in all of this is half of the people will lose the jobs that they now have. <clears throat> and the society must create solutions for them. Yeah. And the best idea I've heard so far is the idea of basic minimum income. And it's not enough to say, I'm going to train you. I don't want to be trained. I'm a coal miner. I've been working in the fields for 55 years. Now you want to train me to become something else? I don't. I don't want you to create any policies and decisions that take away my job and give it to some Mexican or Canadian. If you're going to do that, then you make sure that I, my salary is preserved. Tax everybody and give me my salary then you can make any stupid policy you want. <laughs> That's where I think the society has to evolve to. <clears throat> yeah. We're not there yet, but basic minimum income is a starting point so that every person, whether you're a billionaire or none, nothing at all, gets $30,000 a year. Yeah. Oh, one, one more last point. Um, you're spending um, a significant amount of time in China Right. And China recently has made it a national <coughs> priority to compete and be a significant player in the field of artificial intelligence. How well do you think they'll do? They'll do very well, but important thing is, today's New York Times article has a very interesting story on Xi Jinping, which says they want to be the leader in the economy of the world. They want to kind of do that by having a single party system and they want to have one leader who is a benign dictator. We can disagree with any of those things. And then when you disagree, they say, look at the democracies. They're complete chaos. And so I'm not sure what the right answer is, but that's what they're leaning towards. In every technology they've started, they have a huge amount of resources, mainly because they don't have the problem you and I have of paying high wages. So there's a large part of the people and there's no ownership of property. The government owns the property, so they can actually collect, you know, there's no taxation, everything goes to them. And then they distribute whatever money they want on anything they want. So. It's a Marxian you know, philosophy saying no ownership of property. But people do own things, and, uh, but it's a different economic system which they're trying to enforce. And uh, in, when you have a billion three people, it's not clear how they're going to do it. But from a technology point of view, they're doing extremely well. They have the three largest, the the three largest supercomputers in the world, and so in order to build them, they build their own chips, and they they're building their own networking system. They're building all the fiber, so in every area, they're able to innovate. And the important thing to remember is, China, the DNA of innovation is has been there for thousands of years. They invented paper, they invented compass, compass, all kinds of innovation, many of them, gunpowder, everything came from China. So you don't want to underestimate their ability to innovate on every dimension, including AI. How should we, how should we compete, America, in response to that kind of uh, competitive challenge? I don't know. You know, it would be easy to say we should become a dictatorship or something, which we can't. So the issue is when you have a, our constitution, 
our Thai style democracy, our style of checks and balances in government, things will be slow. The only threat is, <clears throat> this is between, the, the analogy is exactly the same. In 600 BC, there was a democracy, Athens. Greeks had a democracy. Next to them were Spartans, or, and they didn't have a democracy. They kind of trained all of them to be warriors, and, and they invaded and killed the democracy. So this issue of how do you respond to somebody who cl claims that they're going to be the supreme leader of the world and going to kind of create all the technologies and everything. Not clear. I don't know. Fascinating. Well, let's end at that point. Um, it's a really a, <laughs> it's a privilege for me to, to share your journey because it really has transformed the world. So thank yeah. you very much. I, I hope you know we will be able to create a humane society. I don't care whether we have exactly our style of democracy, but if there's a humane society where everyone's problems are taken care of, if you're a coal miner, you know, they have to make sure that your life is not affected. If you do that, then the rest of the things, whether you're a democracy or, or a dictatorship, yeah. is a little different. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll stop.